Here we go. All right. At 7.43, we'll call the meeting to order. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. Studo, Mr. Walner, Mr. O'Leary, and Mrs. Gonzalez. This meeting is being recorded on Zoom as well as by NORCAM. And we'll begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. I'd also ask for uh, my colleagues and the members joining us to, to take a moment of silence to um, honor Bruce K. Donnelly, who passed away September 14th, uh, this past September 14th. He was a 32 year member of our North Reading Police Department. And um, from what I understand from his colleagues who served with him, he was a commu community police officer before community policing even became a term. So if we could take a moment of silence in honor of and remembrance of, Mr. of Officer Donnelly. Thank you. And he leaves his son, who's also a member of the, of the North Reading Police uh, Department, his grandchildren and his family, who are also North Reading people. So you could keep them in your thoughts and prayers. All right, so we're gonna go to our first order of business, which is public comment. Do we have anyone here that wishes to speak for public comment? If you could use the chat function or raise your hand where I don't see anyone. Mr. Gilberto, all set? Great. Then we're going to move on to the first order of business, which is the public hearing, the transfer of the common victual is all alcohol license, BNR North Reading LLC, doing business as Horseshoe Lounge. And I'm just going to scroll to the public notice of hearing. In accordance with chapter 138 of the Massachusetts general laws in in-person and virtual, well, an in-person and virtual public hearing, it's virtual public hearing will be held by the select board on Monday, September 20th, 2021. And well, we said that in room 14, but it's via virtual technology at 7.45 PM. Uh, if anyone shows up, the TA is in person, so you can knock on his door. On the application of BNR North Reading LLC, doing business as Horseshoe Lounge for the transfer of the common victual or all alcohol license from Horseshoe Lounge, Inc., doing business as Horseshoe Grill to be exercised at 226 Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a one-story cinder block building, four rooms, no cellar, and the hearing uh, information to be accessed virtually is posted on the notification together with the phone numbers to access this meeting by the select board to publish September 9th, 2021. All right. So do we have, we're going to, we're going to open the hearing on the application, which is in at page 22 in the, in the application to my colleagues. And I do see the Lees have joined us. And who else do we have here um, to present the application? You have Ryan Cox, Bradley Atkinson, Bradley. and Noah Goldstein. Okay, welcome. And, I, and why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about the application? Sure. Um, we're three relatives. Brad and I are brothers. This is my cousin, Noah. Um, about 13 years ago, we started to open... Uh, get into the restaurant industry. Um, <clears throat> we grew up in Reading, um, kind of moved to the North Shore over time. Always wanted to get back uh, to the area. Um, kind of got introduced to Pat and the Lees and over the last six months or so. Um, found their interest in retirement and thought it would be a really good fit for us to come back to town. So um, we own a, a few restaurants um, and we're excited to add the horseshoe as to, uh, to our family of restaurants. We, we have our whole family pretty much lives in Reading and North Reading. So 
coming back. And you say again, when you talk, I see that the three of you are together, but just tell us your first name, just for recording purposes, so we know. I'm Bradley. Bradley. All right. Brian Cox. And no. And no. No, I know you were introduced, but if you talk just so so that... Jen can record who's who. All right, that's great. And um, I want to open, is there anything else you wanted to add to that presentation in terms of your experience in alcohol sales and restaurant management? Yeah, absolutely. So um, over the past, like I said, the 13 years, uh, we've managed um, various um, restaurants, bars. Um, We are TIP certified. we have dealt with uh, management of staff, uh, training staff, and um, we feel very confident that we can bring our level of experience uh, to the horseshoe. Okay, do, do any of my colleagues have any questions of the applicants? Mr. O'Leary. How do you ever anticipate filling the shoes of the Lees. <laughs> so active in the community, uh, giving to the community. And uh, you know, I come to this hearing uh, with very mixed uh, feelings and emotions. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've known Pat and Kathy virtually my entire life and uh, in their families, uh, extended families and the generations before them. So, I mean, what the Lees have done over the years uh, contributing to the community has been significant and um, it's a tremendous loss to the community and the only thing that i'm heartened by is that uh, pat has already assured me that he's done his due diligence in vetting you gentlemen as far as uh, your willingness to uh, continue to participate in the community uh, at a high level and uh, running a good operation i I, i'm confident that he's not willing to sell to just anybody and uh, right uh, yeah we um so we've been, we've always been a huge part of, uh, philanthropy has been a big part of the business for all of our, all of our operations and so forth. So for example, today we were at the Jimmy Fun Golf Fundraiser. Uh, With in, Pat at the horseshoe. At the horseshoe. <laughs> so yeah. we were there introducing ourselves to everyone, talking to everyone, met the person who has been representing it from the Jimmy Fun. She said it's one of the longest standing, if not the longest standing golf Jimmy Fun events like in the North Shore area. Um, and additionally, we're all, in fact, when, people found out that we were acquiring it. I mean, our phones, my phone, phone didn't stop getting text messages and calls being like, I'm so excited you're coming back to town. And it's perfect that you're taking over uh, a restaurant that has been such a big part of the community. And again, since you're all from this area. So we've been welcomed already day one, which is- well, One of the nice things we've also been able to work out with Pat is we've been able to actually retain him for six months to- help us, you know, learn uh, the community of North Reading, learn, you know, what he's done, show us the way kind of, um, and, and continue the tradition that the horseshoe has, has uh, instilled in the community. Okay, good. Any other questions, Mr. O'Leary? That was just, kind just of a, in relation to- That was a know, rhetorical question. Yeah, yeah, it was a rhetorical question, yeah. Uh, okay. oh, just also, you know, who's gonna be managing the, the day-to-day operations? It's gonna be one of you gentlemen, I'm, yeah, I'm the I'm the manager of the, of the license. Yeah, and, Ryan. Ryan, yep. And we're also, like we said, we're keeping up the management team, keeping the staff that's on duty there um, for as long as they'd like to stay with us. So really, it's going to be, you know, we're going to be learning from them as to what they've been doing. But I'll be the day-to-day operations person in that building um, for the liquor license. Okay. I'll set for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. To any other questions of my colleagues? Mr. Walner, are you all set? Just are you planning to keep the name as is? Or yes, gonna... absolutely. Everything's the same. Okay. And it is, uh, I, I know Kathy and Pat also, and not as long as Steve has, <laughs> but, you know, for quite a while. And it is, um, you know, it'll be, you'll be sorely missed for sure. So, yeah. Um, anyways, for what it's worth. Mr. Studo, any questions? Yeah. Mr. Studo, all set? All set? Yes. You're all set. Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? Um, just uh, are you going to continue on with the restaurants that you already have? Yes. To what you have? Yes, we are. 
Yeah, that, that was a, a something I'd like to follow up on. How many other restaurants do you currently own and manage? Um, we have 10 restaurants in the Southern New Hampshire and North Shore areas. Um, I've, right now, we don't manage any of them. Um, we have our management teams in place. We own them and we meet with our management teams uh, every other week. Um, so this is what has allowed us to expand and add the horseshoe to our, uh, our restaurant group. So none of you are the named managers of any of those other establishments? Oh, so some of them we are. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head which one, um, but I'm not, we're not, I, I, um, we don't directly manage on a few of the licenses. But you are named as managers. On yeah, on, 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 I think one or two, but I'm not sure which one's off the top of my head. Yeah, on this application though, Ryan, it says you yeah. will be there for 50 hours a week managing uh, yep. the horseshoe grill. Correct, yeah. Because right. we're, you know, we're accustomed to having the named manager actually be on the premises. Correct. To manage what's going on there. Yeah, we absolutely put ourselves 100% into a restaurant when we open it up. So that's, that is our full intention is to be the manager of the, of this store of this license. And so once you take over that store, are you still going to be the name manager of, it, of your other established? I'm not store. I'm sorry, restaurant. Mm -hmm. Are you still going to be the named manager of, of those other establishments? I could, I don't, not sure that I'm on any of the other ones, um, but I'd have to check. I don't remember. Okay. Um, and how much time do you think that Brad, you Bradley would be spending there? Every I'm sorry, day? we keep getting moved from one office to another. I'm sorry. Um, we're out, we're sitting outside now. Uh, <laughs> we, Brad, how often do you, we, we're all, you know, you'll see. Well, if you're yeah, there, if, if you want to, if we, when we open, we're all there all the time and we can, uh, uh, you know, mo change who's on it, depending on who the manager is. If you prefer that down the road, whoever's there as like a full time, um, you know, if it's not one of us that's there, that's no problem to do. Oh, well, it wasn't really, it's not really up to us. It's really up to you to tell us and you have right. You're actually proposing Ryan to be there 50 hours a week. So that's exactly. not really up to us. We're going to hold you to that. Yeah, basically. of course. I probably will be there over 100. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me some other, I have some other questions for and I see there's a couple of hands raised, but you know, there is noted in, in your application, um, one violation that was cited previously and that was for one of your new hampshire places or one of your massachusetts places no it was our first place in 2009 um we had a backyard we have a backyard at the farm barn grill in essex that's fenced in um and there was an underage person who came in um and got a drink and walked off of the fenced in place and walked out um and that we were cited for that and we were served i think a three-day suspended license that we didn't actually have to serve because we went the one year uh without any incidents okay yeah. and, and it's only been in, in, in 13 years only one instance right. and that was in 2009 and that and when you answered that question though you answered that for all of your establishments correct right? for every yeah. yes that's it okay yep. and then i had just a couple more questions before no we go to the hands that are raised here and so uh, your um there's a requirement for our board that all of your staff be tips trained um Correct. and are the three of you tips trained um we, we, have, we have been i have to check on when that was if, if we're expired or not currently but we have definitely been tip trained and currently all of the staff that is working there at the horseshoe uh, is tip certified Okay. We're just with Pat actually talking about this today at the yes. golf tournament. And we're okay. maintaining with the current business. We're not changing it with staffing. Okay. But the three of you don't know if you're currently TIP certified? I don't know. We're off the top of my head right now. No. Okay. Oh, we definitely had been. Yeah. I just don't know if it's expired or not. Right. Right. Okay. Um, I, okay. Why don't we, um, 
go to the hands raised. I see Robert. And is this for comment portion yet? Because I just want to make sure we complete the questions from the board. Okay. Mrs. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, so you're saying that it's going to be there for 50, 50 hours plus. Um, but it sounds to me like you do that for a certain amount of time and then you step out and you have like a management team. Is that, that's what you've done prior? Well, we've, to the other yeah, so we've created, um, obviously this isn't the only restaurant we have. So we've, in order to stay um, in business and continue to fight through COVID and everything that we've done and the restaurant business is incredibly difficult. We've had to build a team. We've had to build a team of managers of people that are experts in different areas. So that is how we've been so strong is by building that infrastructure. So, um, yeah, we always in the, no matter what, in the beginning of an operation, it, we, it may take us well, six months, one year, three years, depending on the operation. So we, we couldn't say how long it would be, um, you know, until we had a management team. We don't know, you know, very well. We've met the managers over at Pat's at the Horseshoe currently, but we have actually, we actually have a meeting with them tomorrow um to discuss more things additionally um can you just you know, one sec i'm so sorry so one yeah. one second please mr gibbler can you just mute everybody other than the people that are that are being that are at, either asking the questions or or obviously the applicants here because it, it's really i can't hear a lot of what they're saying and then we'll just Just can you uh, just unmute the the applicants too, so they can answer the question. There we go. I'm I think sorry we about this. I'm okay. sorry. This is virtual right. here, and so we can't really hear you over when people are joining the meeting. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez, you was asking question in you. Right, right. Get... I lost the question, and they were answering. Okay. Did you get the answer, Mrs. Gonzalez, that you were looking for? Yeah, I, I feel like we got stopped in the middle of. Okay. Um, I, I, I forget whose name is who. I'm sorry. So, uh, to kind of give you a recap on it, we yeah. build uh, systems, you know, and we have a strong support team of managers and so forth that's able to help us uh, run the business because restaurants are incredibly difficult to run. And everything from trying to operate them over the last few years with COVID. That's right. one of the reasons why we have a strong management team. So we have support. I mean, we can't do it by ourselves. And one of the biggest things is, is as we transition and take over this, this um, restaurant, it's been around for 95 years, we're going to learn who the personnel are. There's a good chance that as beautiful and amazing as that restaurant is, there are some holes and there needs to be improvement in different areas. And we're not really going to know that until we get in there. Everything transfers and we actually acquire it. And at that point, we could bring in managers that are well-trained, that have been with us for 10, 12 years. And we could bring them in and have them help kind of figure out what where the issues are and where we need to improve the business. Because, again, as much as it's been around 95 years and it's done incredibly well, I'm sure there are areas that we could always improve on. Thank, thank you for that answer. And, and just know that if Elise has faith in you, then I have faith in you. Because this is their baby. Yeah. Oh yeah. Move it anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've never we've never felt more pressure than this location because of all our connections. It's uh again, we've had my mother is the oldest of nine children and uh, and she her sister is Ryan and Brad's and they graduated from nineteen sixty nine to nineteen eighty nine and then I graduated in nineteen ninety nine and my sister graduated in two thousand and four and so forth. Now we have nephews and little cousins all in Reading and North Reading. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to go to the questions, but I just want to make sure that you, we, we have also have rules and requirements for you to even take over if this gets approved. And that includes, there's a requirement for everybody to be TIP certified. And I understand that you're working with the current staff, but that would obviously include an applicant and, and co-applicants and ma a proposed manager. And I think when we, when we have a manager of record, it's the person that we're gonna look to for responsibility for oversight. And the times that establishments run into issues here, it's when the manager is taking a back seat or at another location and is not hands-on in the store. 
So it's not just the fact that you have the Lees who on any given day, at any given hour, we can find one or more of them there at the restaurant. It's the fact of a responsible manager who's properly trained and properly certified and knows what's expected of them there and is always there and in communication. We have a very active um, you know, group that goes and visits with the establishments and things like that. So there's certain requirements that when you come to the board for the license, we're going to expect that you're prepared for that stuff. Yeah. What's nice as well is, um, is that Pat actually, uh, we are keeping him on for six months to a year as in a contract. He's working full time. That's great. So it's That's not great. like he's leaving tomorrow. So he, he's on. Yeah. Um, He's really going to show. And I assume he's uh, tip certified. Yeah. That's yes, he has. Yes. And don't worry. We now we understand the requirement. We can yeah. be tip certified like that. No problem. Yeah. So. Yes, definitely. Um, and your staff, your whoever you do bring on board, and you know that you know from running these establishments, you don't just plop a manager, and you have to get permission from the board to do that if you're shifting manager. But right, so right now we're we're going to be looking at Ryan. So, yep. All right. So let's go. I see hands raised to, and if we, Mr. Gilberto, can we put go to you and then we'll go to Mr. Atkinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a clarification. Well, because I think it's currently operating under Horseshoe Grill, if I'm not mistaken. There's uh, a few legal names. There's actually Horseshoe Cafe as well. Um, so we were just going with one of the legal names. Uh, we're not planning to change the name or turn change or change anything Signing. or signage or anything like that. So you're gonna go. You're gonna operate as Horseshoe Grill. Well, tech. Yes, we are. Yeah, I mean, technically, it's Horseshoe Cafe. Um, is the is the legal name. Um, so. We we were had to make a choice as to which one, but we're staying with it. We're not changing the title, the name, the sign, not anything in the place. So it'll be the Horseshoe Grill, yes. Horseshoe Grill, okay. Yeah. And Mr. Atkinson, did, you're yeah. muted. Yes, there we go. Oh, uh, I, oh. just yes. want to say hi to my second cousin Brad and <laughs> your dad Danny. Hey, how's it going? And your, and your and your and your grandpa Uncle Lenny. Yeah, I was gonna. Uh, I was gonna say, Mister Atkinson. I'm looking at myself. What? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll be, before before you go on, I'm gonna open up the this part portion of the hearing where we hear from people who want to speak in favor of the license, and let you go ahead, Mister Atkinson, and get All right, on record. Well, my my, I'm definitely in favor. I've been to a number of his places. They're well run. The food's great, and it's always nice to help out family. Right. Thank you so much. So, yeah. So, again, say hi to your dad and say hi to your granddad. Will do. I appreciate it. Yep. All right. Oh, yeah. My Auntie Jenny says hi. Nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Does anyone else, uh, is there anyone else in attendance that would like to speak in favor of this? Mr. Mr. Lee. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, you know, it was mentioned earlier that uh, this is our baby and that uh, for four generations, there's been Lees or Toomey's running this operation and putting in their heart and soul into it. Uh, Kathy and I have been doing it for the last 36 years. So we wouldn't take a, a move like this lightly. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, was talked about earlier by Ryan, when we kind of got together, uh, the person who introduced us, the broker, knew how I felt about who was going to have to take over. It wasn't just about someone who could pay me the most money or, you know, had to be the horseshoe. No, we wanted the right people uh, to take and value the concept that was there, the years and the, the uh, I'll say the reputation that the horseshoe had garnered over all these years and value it. And, and they demonstrated time and time again that they have. And uh, so we feel quite comfortable with, this group of, of uh, three gentlemen that are uh, very passionate about the business. Uh, they've talked about their systems. They're obviously successful in a number of other restaurants. And we're feeling quite comfortable about turning this over and uh, letting them take it to the next level. Um, you know, it's 
not an easy move for us. <laughs> um, but I think it's something that we feel comfortable in. And, uh, and again, that was mentioned earlier that I'm going to be sticking around for the next six months. Um, I call it a goodwill ambassador, but uh, there to help in the transition, help in uh, with not just the, the sale of, of alcohol and food, but the, the people who have worked for us for 20 and 30 years, uh, making sure that that transition is smooth with new ownership. Um, guests that have been coming in for, for decades and, and families have been coming in for generations. I want to make sure that that continues to be a smooth and enjoyable experience for them. And, and uh, so, yep, they're taking over, but um, I'm not going to let go too easy. <laughs> but no, seriously about the, the sticking around for the next few months to, to help in this. And Kate, to or Madam Chair, to your point, um, make sure they understand how this board and the other committees in town want to see this business run and uh, the commitment to the TIPS training and to the standards that the Board of Health hold and the building inspector and so on and so forth. Um, that's where I come in, you know, maybe a little advisory uh, uh, job that I'll have, role that I'll have to, to help them get acclimated and make that smooth transition and make that first impression, a good impression on the general public to come in. So um, I think we've got a good group of people here. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor? Mr. Gilbert, you're gonna to have to tell me if anyone's hand is raised. I do not see that. All set? All right, we'll close that portion. Is there anyone that wants to speak in opposition to this license? I see none, Mr. Uh, Gilbert. You know, I might like to speak in opposition, but I'm gonna vote for it. <laughs> I don't want the lease to give it up. <laughs> Uh, this, is why, this is why we didn't let my mother come to the meeting. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I was going to say, where's Veronica? I wouldn't be too happy about it. <laughs> we understand that sentiment totally, but at least they, they at least they're enlisting the least to, to stay on board too and just kind of get acclimated with it. I did notice I heard one year, then six months, then a few months. So I think we'd want, we'd prefer a longer period of time, but. Not that's not to say anything about your skill set that you're bringing to the table to the to the three of you either. All right, I hear I see none. Do you see any, uh, Mr. Gilberto? Okay, seeing none, I will close that portion of the meeting. And there is there any other discussion? I see none. Can we have? Do we have a motion? And don't forget you're muted, Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to approve a transfer of the common particular all alcohol license from Horseshoe Cafe Inc. DBA Horseshoe Lounge to BNR North Reading LLC DBA Horseshoe Lounge 226 Main Street. Second. It's a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Just one comment. Sure, Mr. O'Leary. Happy, healthy, and long retirement to the lease. But don't leave town. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Good luck. Congratulations. Welcome back. Welcome back, I guess. Thank you. Honor, Thank you. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. All right, our next order of business is the 8 p.m. Warrant Article Informational Hearing for the October 4th, 2021 town meeting, which was rescheduled from October 2nd. Just let me have a second to scroll to that notification. All right. The Town of North Reading notice a virtual informational hearing. The North Reading Select Board does hereby notify the residents of the Town of North Reading that a virtual informational hearing on the following articles contained in the October 4th, 2021 Town Meeting Warrant will be held Monday, September 20, 2021, 8 p.m. Please note that fall annual, the October Town Meeting was rescheduled from October 2nd to October 4th. 
and the hearing access information, the virtual information is published and the phone information to dial in is published. This hearing will represent an opportunity for residents to learn more about the articles on the town meeting warrant, to ask questions and to engage in discussion in advance of the fall annual town meeting. The listing of warrant articles is as follows. Article one here and act on reports of town officers and committees. Article two, prior year bills. Article three, appropriate money to stabilization fund. Article four, appropriate money to capital improvement stabilization fund. Article five, appropriate money to solid waste stabilization fund. Article six, appropriate money to participating funding arrangement fund. Article seven, amend the fiscal year 2022 operating budget. Article eight, rescind authorization to borrow. Article nine, amend the FY 2022 capital budget. Article 10, appropriate money for wastewater planning, design, engineering, and or permitting. Article 11, appropriate money for legal fees, secondary school building litigation. Article 12, appropriate money for legal expenses, 20 Elm Street litigation. Article 13, authorize the conveyance of town owned land for affordable housing, 57 Haverhill Street. Article 14, authorize the conveyance of town owned land for affordable housing, 44 to 46 Oakdale Road. Article 15, authorize the conveyance of town owned land for affordable housing, 7 St. Teresa's Street. Article 16, authorize the Northeast Metropolitan Regional Vocational School District construction project. This hearing is being held pursuant to sections 18 through 25 of chapter 30A of the Massachusetts General Laws, the extended virtual discussion in advance of the town meeting. We sincerely hope that you will join us for this hearing on September 20, 2021 at 8 p.m. And it's signed by the members of the select board published on September 16, 2021. So we'll open the informational hearing. And Mr. Gilberto, do you have a presentation you're going to share? We're going to, we're going to actually... Um, turn it over to you for um i do madam chair yes thank you i have a powerpoint presentation that oh, i will like us for uh, for each article and i will take them in order as they appear on the warrant um and madam chair i, I am told that there may be um intermittent audio issues on the norcam norcam feed and that um norcam has been working to address it um anybody who has maybe experiencing an issue with the audio, I would encourage you to go to the town website. You go to the homepage and click on the calendar link, and then you go to today's date and click on the meeting notice for this evening's meeting. You can go directly to the Zoom feed, um, which is the virtual platform on which this hearing is being conducted. And you should be able to hear uh, the, the audio if that issue has not already been resolved. Mr. Gilberto, too, I just want to, for, for those members, uh, for those citizens participating, we have quite a few individuals participating. And, and if you have any questions as we go through this presentation, um, to, to either use the chat or raise hand function, um, and it's at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a chat icon there that you press and you can type in the chat. We'll be trying to look at both. And then for reactions, if you press that, you can raise a hand um, as, as the, it's on the bottom bar, it says raise hand and it's a, it's a, a yellow hand. So that would, you can find that in, in the bottom icons under reactions. Madam Chair, I will share my screen, which will be the PowerPoint slideshow. And I'm hoping everyone can see a full screen slide that says warrant article informational hearing if folks could not, if that is in fact what they see. Okay. Okay, this is the warrant article informational hearing for the fall annual town meeting, Monday evening, October 4th, 2021 at seven o'clock PM at the North Reading Middle High School. This uh, slide summarizes available funding. Um, we customarily make this information available. I won't go through the entire listing of funding sources, but I, I will identify first uh, the top line free cash. That's something that reflects the balance of appropriations from the previous year, as well as revenue uh, above our anticipated forecast. 
uh, the finance director who was on this call has submitted our um, free cash calculation to the Department of Revenue and it is pending uh, before them now. Similarly for water department retained earnings, which is a, a number that relates to our um, water enterprise. And then the final number I will identify for purposes of discussion is the balance of the proceeds for sale of town owned land at $19.6 million. Those are funds we received largely due to the sale of the former JT Berry, proper, JT Berry property um, near the Wilmington town line. Taking the articles in order, article one, here an act on reports of town officers and committees submitted at the request um, of committees and officers. And the select board has recommended with the finance committee uh, determining that no action was required. And I'm not seeing anything in the chat and I'm not seeing anything amongst the attendees either. Madam Chair, I'll continue to article two. Yes, please. Prior year bills, there are no known bills at this time, but we customarily hold this warrant article open right up until the evening of town meeting to address anything that comes up. It's intended to address bills uh, submitted for a financial period for from a, a previous fiscal year. And I'm looking to the chat as well as to the, um, the slides that I'm not seeing anybody here with their hand raised. Okay, moving through to article three, appropriating money to the stabilization fund. It's the town's rainy day fund with a balance of just under $3.8 million. We are not anticipating recommending a transfer at fall town meeting. Um, however, it's possible that a recommendation would be made um, in conjunction with the financial plan for the next uh, the financial plan for the next fiscal year at the June town meeting. And I'm looking to the chat. I do not see any questions in the chat. I am looking on the screen here, and I'm not seeing any any questions or hands raised there either. Madam Chair, Article 4, appropriating money to the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund. This fund is used for capital expenses and for debt service. The fund balance is just under $1 million. And we're recommending a transfer of $250,000 with the funding source being free cash. This article has previously been recommended both by the Select Board and by the Finance Committee. And this funding is in accordance with our ongoing capital improvement financing plan. No hands and no chat, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Article five, appropriating money to the Solid Waste Stabilization Fund, the balance of that fund being $202,311.84. We're recommending a transfer of $36,757.60, which represents the uh, unexpended portion of the solid waste budget from the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. And I am it's looking- not, nothing in the chat and I don't see any hands raised. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article six, appropriate money to the participating funding arrangement fund. This fund is a reserve account to pay for the town's portion of future employee health insurance costs. The balance is $1.1 million. We are projecting at this time a transfer from free cash in the amount of $350,000, which reflects the town's portion of the remaining funds from the fiscal year 2021 employee health insurance program. Um, as I've mentioned previously, this is something that uh, continues to be updated as claims are paid from the health insurance program. And the number will be confirmed uh, on or about October 1st. The select board has recommended and the finance committee um, we'll make a recommendation at town meeting. And there's no, nothing in the chat and no hands raised. Article seven, amending the fiscal year 2022 operating budget. I've just listed here some departmental considerations. One is for parks and recreation, um, greater than anticipated uh, permit and program revenue may allow for a de decrease in the summary excuse me, in the subsidy that the general fund has provided in the fiscal year 22 budget. That's something that we're working on with the parks director and with the staff, including the former parks, to, parks and recreation department head um, to nail down. And um, I expect we'll have a firm number on that um, at the meeting um, right prior to the beginning of town meeting. We're aware of our pending um, youth substance abuse grant application. And so um, we are aware that uh, we're hoping for favorable news uh, soon on that. And if, uh, we're prepared with a potential recommendation for a transfer if that were not to materialize. 
And then finally, as I announced at the last select board meeting, uh, the elder services and town clerk positions are expected to be um, vacated at the beginning of next year and we'll be advertising them and uh, we may be looking to make adjustments within those budgets as necessary. I'm not recommending any particular transfers at this time, more just highlighting uh, issues that we're looking at that we may ask for action on um, as we get closer to town meeting. With both the finance committee and the select board opting to recommend at town meeting these articles. No, nothing in the chat and no hands raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article eight, rescinding authorizations to borrow. There are no bonds recommended to be rescinded at this time, although we recommend the article be held open for a recommendation until we get to town meeting and both the select board and the finance committee have opted to make a recommendation at town meeting. Okay, no, nothing in the chat, no, no hands raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article nine, amending the fiscal year 2022 capital budget. We are not anticipating any amendments at this point in time and expect that it will be recommended to be passed over. Um, the select board and the finance committee both will uh, make their recommendations um, at town meeting. Nothing in the chat, no hands raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article 10, uh, appropriating money for wastewater planning, design and engineering. Um, our intention would be to request leave of the town meeting. Um, I wrote in there 15 minutes for the presentation uh, to depend upon how fast you know, this goes. And if we think we need more time, then we certainly can request that of the, uh, of the moderator. Um, these are slides that some of you have seen in different um, forums, including at the Apple Festival over the weekend. They were on display at a tent that was manned by the DPW director and members of the Economic Development Committee. Um, they'll be posted to the town website tomorrow as well for folks who are looking for, the, for this information in addition to this whole presentation. Um, but we have a handful of slides to go through that will describe the project and the request. And now uh, we're happy to answer questions as we go through there. Um, and Mr. Parisi is here, the DPW director. Um, Joe, if you could raise your hand for folks to see you. Um, we have the slides here and I will, um, Joe, I, I know I'd asked you to go through it, but I'll go through the presentation. If you could just hang, hang on there for any questions that might come up, that would be great. Thank you. So the first slide here speaks to, um, to the need supporting economic development. Um, currently any residential or commercial development in North Reading requires construction of an on-site disposal or septic system. The town believes that making available a wastewater collection utility or public sewer in commercial areas will promote economic development by making more land area usable for development and by allowing for more dense development in our commercial industrial areas. Increased economic development will provide more local services and more local job opportunities for the region. A wastewater collection system will also make possible more multifamily housing construction along Main Street, creating population density to support new business. Uh, a slide that we've added is addressing public health and the environment. Um, each are protected by improving surface and groundwater quality, including lakes, rivers, aquifer, and wetlands providing sustainable long-term solutions for wastewater management, establishing sewer service for existing commercial industrial base and establishing service, sewer service for future uh, commercial industrial residential base as well. This is a slide that describes the timing um, and, the, and the need for the funding at this time. Um, there's an opportunity to partner with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, potentially reducing the cost of construction. To take advantage of this opportunity, planning and design need to begin this fall. A request for construction funding, construction, will be prepared for the October town meeting next year in 2022. Investing in design now will better position the town for anticipated federal and state grant programs along the way as we work towards a decision at the October 2022 town meeting. This slide shows an overview of the in-town wastewater collection system, and um, it should look very familiar to most folks on this call, although we have modified it to make clear that the, um, so this is, it's oriented with the west on the top and the north to the right. This is the town of Andover. The proposed uh, wastewater collection system would run all the way down Main Street. There would be a leg that would come off North Street to Lowell Road, picking up the 900 or so units at the Edgewood and Pulte developments near the Wilmington town line and an area that would go down Park Street and then down Concord Street 
excuse me, uh, right to just shy of the Teradyne um, at the Wilmington Town Line as well. And so these are the, the major areas, as you can see, highlighted um, are in blue, um, and really aiming at addressing uh, economic development along the commercial corridors of the town. The wastewater conveyance system to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District where the wastewater would be treated. Again, that same orientation um, with the west being to the north and north being um, the west being to the top and the north being to your right. Um, this blue line here again picking up Main Street at the end over town line um, and then jogging off on Route 125 um, all the way up to Route 114 at Merrimack College. Um, continuing down Route 114 into Lawrence where it will pick up an existing Greater Lawrence Sanitary District interceptor that connects to the plant which is actually um, over in the town of North Andover. And circled in green here is the highlighted area. It's a pretty um, a densely utilized area between the two intersections of 125 um, to the southeast and then to the southwest and to the northeast. So this is a, a, essentially the area around Merrimack College and a little bit beyond that headed back toward the town of North Andover and Middleton. And um, this is an area where GLSD, or excuse me, where Mass Department of Transportation is looking to dig up the road to do util utility relocation and also to, um, to do some, some reconfiguration of the layout as well, presenting the opportunity um, at that time for uh, a utility wastewater pipe to go in the ground. This shows the anticipated project schedule. And you see here, we are contemplating a permitting process that would go through into the third quarter of next year, but it would begin this fall. Um, similarly, a sewer financing planning and an update on property value analysis. I put it in red to make that a little more clear. I know that was a question at our last meeting when this was discussed. It will follow a similar timeline of about one year um, leading up to the October of 2022 town meeting. You see here the State Department of Transportation will be designing its project and then bidding its project in the fall and, um, and the fall fourth quarter and first quarter of 2023, 2024 respectively. So that's a similar deadline as to what we would be working um, off of with regard to our portion of the project. So we would at, under, undergo a preliminary design starting this, quarter, this fourth quarter up until the first quarter of 2023 and finalize that design in 2023 um, with funding that we would seek in addition to the construction funding at the October, 2022 town meeting. The project would be bid in the first quarter of 2024 and construction would take place from uh, 2024 through into 2026 on a parallel course to the Department of Transportation construction. This shows you a preliminary design cost estimate and um, this is a different presentation than some of you have seen where we've broken out just the request for this upcoming town meeting for um, ease of presentation. You see that we are requesting a total of $2.893 million um, in um, funding uh, proposed at this October town meeting, 1.063 million of which would be used to design the in-town wastewater collection system. So again, Main Street, North Street and Lowell Road, Park Street and Concord Street. 1.63 million would be for uh, pre preliminary design um, of the conveyance from the town line to the plant in North Andover. Again, as I articulated earlier through Route 125 and Route 114. These are some other project costs, including legal and administration um, costs, and then the sewer financing and update of the property value analysis, which is both, both categories at $100,000 each, bringing us to that total of 2.893 million. That's the amount that we anticipate requesting at October town meeting this year. And the anticipated funding source at this time is funding from the proceeds, proceeds of the sale of town owned land. Although there continue to be efforts to identify potential design grant funding sources and to look at any available funding source that could lower that, that number. This is the final design and construction cost estimate, the balance of the cost of the project. Um, it's a significant um, both design and construction project uh, totaling $113 million, which we would be looking to request at the October 2022 town meeting. And um, we would be detailing at that town meeting exactly how the financing would occur um, through the various funding sources, including um, any, um, any available state or federal grant funding that we are able to obtain between now and then. 
as well as uh, exploring potential uh, betterment of, of the properties along the route and a share of the cost being borne there and um, considering um, what, if any, contribution might need, need to be made by the general fund uh, through the taxpayer as well. Those are all things that we'll be looking at over the course of the next year. But in order to pro properly do so, we would need to um, continue the design of the, uh, of the system as requested um, in the $2.893 million request. This shows you again, the summary of the timeline. We actually already have a grant um, pending with the state for design and permitting. Um, I, I think we were hoping that we would be able to get a response on that application, but it, it looks like their, their award uh, period will be just after the, uh, the town meeting. If that grant were awarded and we, we applied for $330,000, uh, it would reduce what we would need to expend from any authorization. So it would reduce that $2.83 million number by whatever amount we get from the state. Um, and so we'll be asking for that preliminary money, design and permitting money in this fall. The final design and construction would be the following fall. And we'll be looking at federal infrastructure funding this year and one-stop construction funding from the state from 2020 through, to, through 2024. And Madam Chair, that's, uh, that's sort of the, the presentation. I, I didn't time myself, so I apologize. I don't know how long it took. Uh, but we tried to hit all of the things that we've heard in terms of questions along the way here and, and to you know, be respectful of people's time as well. There are a number of folks here to help answer questions, including the DPW director and um, uh, consulting engineers from, um, from Wright Pierce, which is our consulting engineer on both this and our water project. I also believe the water superintendent is here as well. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to questions. And Mr. Atkinson, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is just for the constructing of the three mains discussed. This doesn't involve connecting to any of like the Martins Pond neighborhood or anything like that. Through you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, the, the construction project that you've seen presented here would not uh, go into uh, the residential neighborhoods. That's correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I do not see any um, anyone in the chat room, and I don't see any other hands raised. Mr. Buckley. Oh no! Me. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Atkinson. Are you all set? Your hand is still raised. Did you have a follow up question? Yes, I did. I had a follow up question. Go ahead. Um, would this uh, allow for future? Would this allow as a starting point for a future expansion if we needed to expand elsewhere in town or to um, uh, or would that be part of a, not a separate uh, appropriation, but would it technically allow for a future expansion if necessary? Or would we have to do more work to allow to tie into that system? Um, Madam Chair, through you, and you know, it certainly can be, you know, anyone else who wants to weigh in, you know, it could do so. But the intention is to, as we're looking at this preliminary design, consider what steps we could take to allow for that expansion if that was something we wanted to pursue down the road. Um, I, I think from our previous conversations, uh, you have a bit of an engineering background, so it's not as simple as just put more flow in, a, in, in, the, in the pipe. It's something we'll have to consider as we go through the design. But I, I do think that that's a, a strong consideration we want to, to, to keep available to the greatest extent possible. But uh, I, I do think it's clear that the priority, as you see here, is the economic development component of it on the commercial corridor. Yeah, well, my biggest concern is I don't mind spending the money because it's necessary, but uh, I just want to leave room for future expansion. And again, like you say, there's a significant engineering component with that, uh, primarily to protect the uh, Martin's Pond area, the effluent, that's been an ongoing problem for years. Um, this has been uh, articles similar to this have been placeholders at previous town meetings. I would say for at least uh, I've, as long as I've been going to town meeting, which is the past five years or so. And I just want to make sure we don't shoot ourselves in the foot by setting up the initial system and not allow room for future facilities or future expansion as time and budget permit or protect or perhaps uh, other issues in terms of wastewater and portions of town that may require a future um, sewer application. OK, 
Okay, Mr. Atkinson, I'm gonna turn that over to Mr. Early. Appreciate your comments. And before we get to anyone else that has their hands raised for question or comment or discussion, uh, we do have uh, two of our board members working closely with um, closely on the team with regards to this, and that includes Mr. Studo and Mr. O'Lear. Mr. O'Lear, did you want to address that? Yeah, just, just to um, allay some of the concerns and issues that uh, Mr. Atkinson just brought up, I mean, it's our intention to allow for uh, future expansion primarily off of Route 28 and Concord Street, not necessarily towards town center, uh, or that direction. We are intending on having uh, in the infrastructure um, tie-ins so that are shutoffs there so that we could, if we wanted to expand down Burroughs Road, we'd be able to do that uh, rather easily and we wouldn't have to dig up Route 28 to, to get it all done again. Um, so anyway, so that is being contemplated uh, for sure and included in the plans. Same thing down at you know, Eames Street, Burnett Road area. Um, but again, that's for future expansion. We also, in our permitting process, have allowed for enough room uh, through gallonage that we're, we're gonna be permitted for to address the situations like over at Mods Pond. We wouldn't have to go back for any additional permitting in relation to additional um, gallons being shipped up to Greater Lawrence Sewer to do so. So what we're looking for from a permitting standpoint would allow for the future expansion off of Route 28. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Studio, do you need to add anything to that? Are you, you good? Okay. Not this time. Thank All you. right. M M Mr. Mr. Atkinson, you still have your hand raised. Did you have a follow-up question on that? I did. Uh, my other concern would be, uh, would there be access through Haverhill Street where it crosses into Andover slash North Andover and 114 at Boston Hill? Uh, as part of this, so would that allow for a future tie-in on Haverhill Street, if if necessary? Through you, Madam Chair, no. Yes, Mr. O'Leary. Quick answer, no. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. All right. That was easy. <laughs> All set, Mr. Atkinson. Yep. All set. All right. So, Mr. Buckley, welcome. Good evening, yes. everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Of course. I, I just I just want to take a minute because I don't want to do it in front of everybody, but I wanted to publicly thank you guys, at least in a small meeting for all the work that goes into this. You know, I know that for many, many years, people have talked about sewers and the, and talked about the challenges of not having them. And I just appreciate regardless of what happens at town meeting, I hope that it passes. But I really do appreciate that the work that has gone into this to at least put it before the town to make a decision on this, because you have to do you have to take the first step in order to do this. And so rather than talking about this, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this by the select board, by Mr. Gilberto, by the finance director, just to at least put this to before a vote. I feel like this is the time if we're going to do it, interest rates are low, you know, there's federal and state money that, you know, seems to be out there. And I feel like we're at a crossroads. So I just appreciate all the work that has been done to at least put this up for a vote. And so I uh, support the work the select board is doing and just wanted to thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. All right, how about any more questions or comments or discussion? If you could raise your hand or make a note in the chat room or unmute yourself. I don't see any, any other hands raised, Mr. Gilberto. I don't see any other chat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for the comments. So we're moving on to the next. Article. Madam Chair, through you, the next article, Article 11, the appropriation of funding for legal expenses for our ongoing secondary school building litigation. This article would provide additional funding for legal expenses related to the secondary school building project. And um, the request um, is anticipated to be $200,000 with a funding source being free cash. Okay. I see no, no hands raised and nothing in the chat. Madam Chair, through you, similarly appropriating money for legal expenses for the 20 Elm Street litigation. Um, spoken with town council, we have sufficient funding in place to carry us um, well into, um, into next year to the uh, next available town meeting. And um, therefore, uh, no funding request is anticipated to be necessary at this town meeting. 
And I see one hand, Madam. Yes, I see Mr. Atkinson, you have your hand raised. Yes, just wanted to thank you guys for the work you've been doing on 20 Elm. And uh, I'm glad we don't need any more money at the moment, but if you need any more, I, I would think that that would be fine by me because uh, that project is really gonna impact uh, our neighborhood. Of course, I'm on uh, Elm Street at 82 Elm. So uh, I'm less than a quarter mile from that project and we're keeping a close eye on things. Great. Thank you for the feedback. Now, are there any other questions or comments or discussion? I do not see any other hands raised or anything in the chat room. Thank you, Madam Chair. Article 13 will address um, three article, excuse me, articles 13, 14, and 15, three similar articles related to affordable housing um, and the construction of, of potential construction of affordable housing on town owned land. Um, Madam Chair, I'm joined here by the town planner, Danielle McKnight, as well as um, I see at least one member of the planning commission, the chairman, Mr. Pierce, who's here as well. Through you, Madam Chair, I, I would, uh, I'll, I'm gonna operate the slideshow, but ask the town planner if she could go through the presentation um, slide by slide, if that's okay. And if, if it's okay with the, you and the members of the board, um, we'll take all three articles for purposes of presentation at the same time. And then if we wanna take questions on a parcel by parcel basis, perhaps we could do it that way. All right, question or comment. Mr. Gilberto, did you wanna go through the slide presentation on this? I will operate the slideshow, but Mrs., uh, Mrs. McKnight will present it. Okay. Right, so we'll just take a few minutes to have this presentation and I don't see Mrs. McKnight. Oh, I do see you. All right. Okay. All right. Our, our town planner. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I will try to be brief. I know that you heard a presentation on this from me um, at your last meeting. And also um, we did a neighborhood meeting um, for a butters last Thursday, um, but I just wanted to go through it for everyone's benefit. Um, being the public hearing for the uh, Warren article. Um, so the CPC's goal uh, is for these four properties uh, located in the affordable housing overlay district to be conveyed to a developer for small affordable housing projects to be built. The properties are zoned to allow this um, and the CPC went through a planning and screening process uh, and to identify these properties um, in the district in 2008, um, but the town does still currently own the properties. Um, this Danielle, is a town I, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, but Michael, you can't see the map, so which if you could just designate by color, you can't really, I can't really read and I have my glasses on. So which which portion are we looking at here on the town map that's designated for this zone? So this is the whole district. The yes. outlined properties in bright red are all of the 23 properties. This map is not very helpful. It's only to show the full okay. district. And uh, we can just jump right into the oh, that's slides great. showing the individuals. All right, yeah. great. I'm sorry, I didn't mean Ms. McKnight. So can, please continue. So this was all done based on a study of the land and the parcels back in 2008. Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, so this is a closer look of um, seven, uh, the location of 7 St. Teresa Street. This property is located behind the multifamily building at 258 Main Street. Several single family homes are across the street and the undeveloped parcels next to it and down and across the street are owned by the Conservation Commission and are not proposed for development. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, 44 and 46 Oakdale Road together make half an acre. Um, the road was extended and improved with a paving and water main and hydrant several years ago. Um, there are some wetlands to the north, and so we would anticipate a filing with the Conservation Commission, depending on the placement of a home um, on this property. Uh, next slide, uh, slide, please. 57 Haverhill Street is a site that belonged to RMLD before the town acquired it in a land swap. There are areas of wetlands around the front and the southeast side of the property, and so placement of any homes and septic systems would take those into account with a Conservation Commission filing anticipated uh, depending on placement. I will have more on all these properties, specifically 57 Haverhill Street, a little bit later in my presentation um, when I discuss the neighborhood feedback I received at our meeting on September 16th. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these four properties, along with um, the other 19 parcels in the district, uh, were rezoned in 08 um, as the affordable housing overlay district. 
Um, the properties were scattered throughout the town's residential neighborhoods, um, and they have also been highlighted in the town's housing production plan as a good opportunity to develop several units of affordable housing, um, but have not yet been conveyed for this purpose. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to address what can be built here on these sites, um, one or two family homes can be constructed by right. Um, a special permit would be needed for a larger development, such as single family attached houses or multifamily housing of up to eight units. There are also provisions for reusing municipal buildings for this purpose um, that does not apply to any of these properties. Um, there are also dimensional and density limits that need to be met and 40% of the sites need to be left as open space. Building area is limited to 20% of a site for a single family and 25% of a site for a two family or a multifamily. The maximum height allowed is 2.5 stories or 35 feet, which is the same height allowed in the, in the rest of the town's uh, residential zoning districts. The zoning was written for this district to make development blend well with the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the intent is for small scale development and not for structures taller than their surrounding zoning districts, though more units are allowed than in the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, setbacks are also similar to the limits on other single family zoning districts. Single and two family homes in this district need a front setback of 25 feet, a side setback of 20 feet, and a rear setback of uh, 25 feet, which is a little bit less than um, single and two family home, uh, single family homes are currently. For multifamily and single family attached homes, the requirements are a 25 foot front setback, a 25 foot side setback, and a rear setback of 40 feet. There's a maximum density of one unit per 5,000 square feet of lot area in addition to these other limits. Next slide, please. The affordable housing, the affordable unit, units built under this bylaw need to meet the requirements um, to be included on the town's subsidized housing inventory. While the bylaw allows for some market rate development along with affordable units in some cases, the CPC's goal for this um, project is for all the units to be built as affordable units. And in fact, would um, like the town meeting motion to reflect this. Um, the bylaw does allow for a range of affordability with the affordable units priced to be affordable to households earning up to 80% of the area median income. Um, next slide, please. The CPC would like the town to convey these properties um, for no money to an affordable housing developer. We are not recommending that they be sold for market rate development. Um, the preference would be for 60% area median income um, and for all affordable units to be built. Uh, the property would be conveyed, uh, properties would be conveyed by a request for proposals with proposals asked for that would describe the development and the level of affordability. We'll recommend a process where a neighborhood meeting is held uh, for input prior to asking the select board to release an RFP. Any developer selected would be asked to hold neighborhood meetings to present their project and answer, answer questions. For projects within 100 feet of a wetland, the developer will need to file with the Conservation Commission. For projects that are multifamily, the developer would need a special permit from the CPC, uh, which would hold a public hearing. For single and two-family homes, um, no site plan review hearing would be held, but a neighborhood meeting would be scheduled to discuss the projects. Um, and two of the sites would be subject to a determination of access by the CPC, um, which would also be a public hearing um, because uh, two of the streets are on unaccepted ways, um, which are Oak, uh, this portion of Oakdale Street and St. Teresa Street. And all projects would be subject to um, grading and drainage plans to be approved by the Board of Health as part of the septic approval. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a summary of the, of the neighborhood meeting that we held um, on September 16th. And I do see that some of the attendees are, are here tonight as well. Um, I, I think that I could pretty safely say that generally speaking, um, neighbors prefer for, site, for the sites to stay in their natural state, um, but if developed, preferred small scale, um, which um, to the feedback that we received, um, I, I would say would be one house for Oakdale Road, either one family or two family for St. Teresa Street, um, and probably um, between four and six units for 57 Haverhill Street. Um, that was the feedback that we were getting the sense that if there were development there, that would be what would be preferred. 57 Haverhill Street was the subject of the most comments and concerns, um, including some follow-up questions uh, that were received today. And these included the safety of the Haverhill and Chestnut um, intersection, uh, concern about wetlands at the south, uh, which is the rear and the easterly parts of the site, uh, flooding and wet conditions on surrounding properties, including those that abut the site um, on Heritage Way. Um, and while I would say that the goal would be for development at the front of site, a front of the site, which would be well away from the wetland buffer, we definitely heard that there was concern um, about impacts to, to abutting properties. 
Um, now, because this site at 57 Haverhill Street is larger and more complex and potentially could have more than a single or two family home on it, um, I would suggest um, if, if um, there was greater comfort with this that we could potentially pass over this article, meanwhile, put out an RFP and um, obtain a site plan and updated wetlands and engineering info um, to have in hand prior to a June town meeting vote so that the neighborhood would know exactly what was being proposed. Um, and that could give some assurance that we aren't proposing, um, you know, many, many units or, um, you know, entirely paving over the site or causing, you know, substantial um, impact in the form of flooding. Um, that is something that we could consider. Um, for the other two properties, I think it would be fairly clear that it, the, the development is so limited that there's very little choice about what could go on those sites. Um, so I would recommend still going ahead with the Oakdale and the St. Teresa Street, but that there could be consideration for putting off uh, 57 Haverhill Street pending the RFP. Um, I did also wanna mention that we heard from um, abutters that we wanted to be sure that the motion clarifies that the development would be for affordable housing only. The zoning does allow for some market rate housing and the underlying zoning allows for regular development. Um, but the CPC's goal is definitely to see only affordable housing on these sites. So um, we would recommend um, including that in the motion. Um, the motion could also restrict the total number of units to be built if um, that offered greater assurance um, as to the size of the project for concerned abutters. Um, we were asked to schedule some site visits prior to town meeting. I'm, I'm trying to coordinate that for a morning um, next week, um, which we'll do our best to get the word out to abutters about that. Um, and then uh, there would be further neighborhood meetings and communication prior to any RFP, um, you know, being prior to us asking the select board to approve an RFP to be issued. Um, so I, I know that when we were here last, uh, the questions were sort of outstanding as far as, well, what does the neighborhood think? And I, I think I've been able to fill in some of, some of those, um, I might my hope that I've summarized um, the neighborhood concerns somewhat accurately here. Um, I definitely was still re responding to some emails, um, you know, even late today um, from, from some concerned about her. So um, that, is, uh, that is the presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer, try to answer any questions um, if there are any. Hey, Danielle, I, I just want to, before we, uh, before we move on to discussion and questions, I, you mentioned that the projects that are at or near conservation land would require permitting. Which of the three are at or near conservation land? Um, depending on where on the site, um, most likely the Oakdale Road one, um, possibly St. Teresa Street, though those wetlands could be far enough away in the back, um, depending on how a house was sited, it might be far enough from the buffer to not require it. Um, and for Haverhill Street, we do have, um, it's, it's a couple decades old, but we do have a flagged wetlands, um, you know, record of where wetlands were on the site, um, it, at least in the 90s. I, of course, that would have to be updated, but um, there is upland available um, and areas outside of the buffer zone. And for the for the scale of development, um, I think it would be entirely possible to develop something without conservation um, being review being triggered. Um, but for all of these properties, it really does depend on the actual physical siting of the buildings on the site and the septic system. All three of these parcels are about wetlands or conservation lands. They're in the vicinity at least. Okay. And then you mentioned also in your presentation that that the concert, um, excuse me, the um, CPC is looking to have these deeded to a developer. And why these three parcels? Were you approached by a developer of, regarding these three parcels? Yes. Um, so the town has been appro approached um, by Habitat for Humanity. Um, while we know that we can't assume who the developer would be until an RFP goes out, it would be an open process. Um, we are well aware that they're very interested in that. Um, they were interested in um, seeing um, several of the sites in the affordable housing overlay district and thought that these three would be um, some of the most suitable for, for development. Um, I think that there are potentially could be other properties that we could look at um, next, um, depending on what happens with these, whether these are developed or not, I think there are other sites we could look at. Um, but one of the reasons that I think these three are more suitable now is they all have roadway access. Some of the properties in this district um, would require a road to be built out, which would add substantial expense to a project. 
Um, some of them have quite a bit more wetland on them. Um, all of the properties in the district are required to have a minimum amount of upland on them to be suitable for development. Um, and these all meet that, um, but some of the properties in this district really uh, um, had what looked like more challenging um, topography and challenging um, water issues. Um, okay, but, so I just wanted to confirm with you that the choice of these proposed parcels was based on a developer approaching you. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's all, I just wanted to confirm that, okay. So if there's no further questions at the moment, I want to go to hands. I do see if someone has put something in the chat room from Megan Hafner. Good evening. We are abutters to seven St. Teresa's. And while we would like to see the property stay in its natural state, we would like to see the property stay in its natural state. We would not like to see a duplex developed if approved at town meeting as our neighborhood is single family homes only. And here's a question from Jennifer Manley. How long would a wetland study take? Dan Danielle. Um, sure, so I think that for the 57 Haverhill Street property, I think what we would, um, what we would do uh, was it would be to ask to issue an RFP um, get the responses um, from potential developers um, who would then be given the opportunity to walk and flag the wetlands. Um, and however long it would take to flag wetlands, um, you know, I would I would not guess it would take all that long, maybe a, a few weeks or months, depending on, um, you know, how when they could get it done. Um, Okay, so it takes a few weeks to a few months. Mrs. Jennifer Manley, I'm going to go to you since I started reading your question. Welcome. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't raise my hand, so I was just putting stuff in the chat. Um, so are we going to decide tonight if it's going to be pushed off to the June meeting? Yeah, that that uh, I think you need to be more clear because you're you're talking about this slide, Danielle, and and you're talking about a wetland study being done after this gets approval by a potential developer. So I think, Miss, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, but you're talking about right now, studying it right now for the wetlands. Is that yeah, and being pushed off from the October right. to the June right. meeting? You, yeah. You're talking about us knowing what what wetlands exist on our exactly. own town parcel. So yep. you're talking about us studying the land. And I, yeah. I do I do think you need to speak more to, to what exactly we know about these parcels um, right now. Sure. Kyle, um, Kyle's iPad. Kyle, we're gonna come to you next, okay? But if you could just mute right now while Ms. Manley's and Ms. McKnight talk. Thank you. Go ahead, Danielle. So the initial plan was, um, and what we I think we were originally hoping to do would be to um, have the town meeting vote and then following that, if it was positive, um, that we would issue an RFP. And at that point, when a developer was selected, the developer would go ahead and do all of their due diligence, um, flag the wetlands, see what needed to be done, see where filings needed to be made on which properties. Um, and then according to that, um, then come in with whatever permits were needed. I was getting the sense that there was such substantial concern about 57 Haverhill Street in, in particular, that it might have made more sense for us for that property only to put off the town meeting vote for that one um, and to hold off on it until June. And in the meantime, we could still issue the RFP and get a response from the developers and allow the developer to go ahead and flag the wetlands and find out whatever they needed to know to, to show the neighborhood specifically, more specifically what the development would look like because that is a more difficult site. I hope that answers the question. Was um, that Kind of. So I guess I'm confused. Why why would we put it out for an RFP before we did a wetland study? I think the the concern on Heritage Way, and I think and Kyle says it a lot better than me in the in the chat. But just those of us, say, you know, we we've only been here ten years, and a lot of people on the street have been here a lot longer. We now pretty much own waterfront property, all of us. I mean, just since the since we've moved in, the the water has increasingly gotten closer to all of our houses. And we've seen with the severe weather just in the past two or three years with the with the amount of storms, the amount of wet area we all have and flooding after, after some of the severe weather and trees down and branches down. So I guess my concern is if there's no wetland study done, but you put out an RFP to the developer, isn't that kind of 
moving this process along and putting it in place before we really know? I don't think there's been a wetland study done since the 90s. May, may I answer that question? Oh, yeah. Yes, Ms. Um, Ms. Yes. Um, so there are two ways to, to do a development project like this. And one way would be to put out an RFP right away find out what we get and say, here's the particular project that we're going to ask town meeting to approve um, and, and dispose of the land. The other way is to dispose of the land first and then permit the project that comes in. And for Haverhill Street, because it is a more complicated site, it, it might make sense to put out the RFP first. Now putting out the RFP doesn't mean that we sell the property. We still would not have permission to sell the property. I think that definitely there have been some of the larger and more complicated projects um, you know, that that, that towns do, often an RFP is done first, so we know exactly what the project looks like. We know exactly, we've given the developer the opportunity to get the wetlands information and present it to the town for permitting. And at that point, then the vote to, to convey the property could, could take place. I, I'm just suggesting that is as a way, if that offers greater comfort to the neighborhood to not have the town meeting vote on this one tonight, but to wait to see where the wetlands are. Because as part of the development, that it, it is just kind of a matter of course, when, when a property has wetlands on it, the developer flags the wetlands, they apply to the Conservation Commission and, the, and they get their permits in that way. Okay. Um, and then in, if it was put off till June and then is it a two thirds vote? 57 Haverhill Street is a majority vote. The other two are two thirds vote because of the way the town acquired those properties. Okay, sorry, 57 Haverhill is majority and the other two are two thirds. Huh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, and then who would be doing the wetland study? It would be um, handled by the developer, but with the Conservation Commission offering their, you know, hearing it and um, doing the permitting, which is there's, how all of our development projects go. It is. There's no independent yes. firm that does that? Um, if the Conservation Commission needs a peer review and wants a third party to look at it, they have the right to hire one. Um, but typically the Conservation Commission handles all of their own um, you know, confirmation of the wetlands. If I may, Mrs. Manupelli. One, one minute, Mr. Pierce, I'm sorry, one minute. I wanna make sure Ms. Manley understands why the distinction in the vote too first before we, we're moving really quite fast along in this. Let's get, a, a, let's get Mr. Gilberto to clarify that. One, is by, one is by majority and the other is by two thirds. And I don't think that was clarified enough to answer the question, so. Madam Chair, through you. Madam, Madam Chair, through you. Hi, Jen, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, so generally it's a two thirds vote to convey any property yeah. um, uh, with regard to a transaction. Danielle has been doing the research with attorney Eichmann at KP, so she would have the explanation with regard to why it's a majority vote for 57 Haverhill. So I would defer to Danielle with regard to that. Okay. I can't explain it in detail, only that there's a difference in how the town acquired the property. It was not a tax title taking, it was a land swap. And for some reason that influences the how, I mean, I'm happy to get more information from town council, but I don't know enough about that to know why it's a majority vote versus a two thirds vote, but I'm happy to find that out. That would be great if you could, thank you. Sure. Are you all set Mrs. Manley with any um, other questions? I, I think so. I know some of my neighbors have some, some good questions in the chat. Well, we'll move on, but if you have anything else, just raise your hand again, okay? Great, Mr. Pierce is, the, is our CPC chair. Mr. Pierce, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure there's a lot of questions and a lot of information. So Mr. Pierce, what else did you wanna add? Well, just that the, um, that the flagging of the wetland is every, you keep saying the developer is going to do it, but the developer himself is not the one who does it. They have to hire a botanist and the botanist has to be certified to, uh, to go out there and actually, um, actually flag those wetlands. And they do it a number of different, there's a number of different things they knew to, do to locate those wetlands. So the Conservation Commission then reviews the work that was done by the botanists. So, so it's, not, it's not the developer themselves. The developer would probably pay for it, but, but it is it actually a professional botanist that would go out and do the flagging. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pearson. I'm not sure about who you mean by you keep saying. I think that the question, oh, well, well, the question related to why would we 
approve all of this at the town meeting and then put out an RP to let a developer do it versus why wouldn't we already know that? So just really quickly before we get to the hands, I'm actually gonna read the additional ch chat. There's one from Kyle Todd. And, and also, sir, if you did wanna add more comment, you could just raise your hand. I am alarmed by the statement that a plan could be created that would not require conservation review because in reality, if blacktop paving and houses replace the woodlands, then the water will have to go somewhere. So at the planning stage, it will look fine, but after the houses are built, many neighbors will be facing flooded basements with no recourse. There's another comment from Jin, Jing, Jing Tzu saying, can town or state be involved with surveying the wetland instead of the builder it would be a conflict of interest if by developer. Kyle Todd also comments, wouldn't a developer be highly motivated to engage a company that would give a favorable review of wetlands compliance? If you were buying a house, would you want the seller to pick the person who conducted the home inspection? The seller's home inspector would say, you're getting a perfect house. Yes, but attorneys also hire expert witnesses who are very supportive of the attorney's case. Okay, so let's move on to some more. Um, okay, I'm going to try to pay attention to this chat, but we're going to move on to some more hands. And I have Heidi Weiberg Hastings, if you can unmute and ask your questions. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Good, evening. Good, evening. Good evening. This is uh, Gary and Heidi together. So my neighbors, um, Jen and Kyle, raised some of the questions that I had, but I wanted to follow up on understanding the process that Ms. McKnight offered to take this article off of town meeting coming up so that we could um, understand the impacts of this a little bit further and understand the plans and get more specific on what those would be. What's the process to make that happen, to, to get it off of this town meeting? So if I cannot, if I'm understanding you, all three of these, re, either, re, these are already in the warrant. So if removing all three of these or continuing all three of these or just taking them off of the warrant no, altogether. Not, um, not taking a vote on these. I'm, I'm just, speaking to 57. Haverhill specifically at this instance. Okay. All right. So um, this, I can tell you right now that this, these were proposed by the CPC. The, the select board has not made a recommendation on this yet. We, were, we would do that after hearing more information and this type of a meeting we would be doing that at the town meeting. The finance committee would be making the recommendation at the town meeting. But Mr. Gilberto, I think we're gonna go over to you in terms of what could be done to either, um, we either vote on this, sure. approve it, it gets approved at town meeting and you heard the different distinctions yeah. between the votes we could, not approve it at town meeting if it fails of the correct vote and then it's ended mm -hmm. or we could uh pass over it if that's the consensus of um the board but what's the process at this point of delaying this or holding it holding it over until june town meeting sure madam chair through you so the the select board signed the warrant on wednesday september 8th um and that, that warrant included all three of the uh, articles related to the affordable housing district. Um, and um, most residents have reported having received that warrant uh, in the mail in the past couple of days. Um, so it's not possible to take the warrant, to take any of the articles off of the warrant for consideration at the October 4th meeting. Um, however, um, in certain instances, the select board has opted um, to pass over an article which means that rather than put down to the discussion, the article itself and a, and a decision whether to approve or not, it's simply a motion to move to the next article on the warrant without approving the prior article. I, I think what I heard the town planner say is that based on the feedback she heard at the, the, at the neighborhood meeting, that that's something she would discuss with the planning commission. The planning commission could ultimately make a recommendation to the select board um, to, um, to pass over an article 
or alternatively, uh, without a recommendation from, from the Planning Commission, the Select Board could propose to pass over an article as well. Those are the, the, the sort of the avenues at this point. But where the, the warrant has been printed and has been mailed, it, it can't come off the warrant. It's just a matter of what we do when we get to it um, that evening. And to the, oh. to the Hastings, I think it's important for you too to know that, and you probably do already know this, but for everybody listening, that's just a recommendation. The, the select board could also not recommend this and, and it, can still, it would still go to a vote. So that's all that is, is a recommendation. So town at town meeting voters could still approve it even if the select board rec doesn't recommend this. Mm -hmm. And if the select board did recommend it, voters could still not vote and, and fail of a vote. I mean, we saw that happen with the turkey farm, for example. So just it's just a recommendation. It doesn't carry the weight of the vote of the individuals attending the town meeting. The weight of the vote is what carries the day in terms of whether or not this passes or fails. So at this point, because it's printed in the warrant and it's being propelled by CPC, there has to be a vote one way or the other on it. So um, if we did make a, if we did vote a town meeting to, to pass over, the town would have to vote in agreement with that. Everybody that votes would have to vote in agreement with that. So I think that's an important point. It's just appreciate, a recommendation. Yeah. Appreciate that clarification. Again, um, as I understand it, um, the CPC commission brought these warrants forward or recommended them after surveying some of the neighbors, including abutters like us, it sounded like um, the CPC lead understood that there were valid concerns, maybe ample concerns to reconsider that. It sounds like that's what I heard from her earlier. So I wanted to understand what the process was if in fact um, it's deemed that, you know, there's consensus here that um, we ought to understand the implications of moving forward this a little bit more than we do today. So uh, appreciate the clarification, appreciate the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comment. I have a uh, Mr. Walner, I did see your hand raised. Was that, was I seeing things or? Yeah, no, I was, Do I, you wanna make any comment on this? I just have a question I think for uh, Danielle. Um, so, uh, you know, one acre is like 44,000 square feet. Oakdale is 20,000 square feet, how would we handle the septic for one to two units? So I think that, um, well, all of these projects would be subject to having a septic approval. Um, and that has to can take into consideration any wetlands that are near the site. So um, once, uh, you know, the property was conveyed to, to a developer, the developer would have to come in for all of the same permitting. Um, and if a, if a septic couldn't be approved on that site, the house couldn't be built. Um, it has to meet all the same standards. Okay. And then on the other two properties, those are one acre or more. Um, why wouldn't we just, why haven't we sold them off in the past? I mean, is there any reason why we're picking these properties to be given away for free versus, I mean, and I understand the affordable housing. I, I support that. So I'm not arguing that, but why wouldn't the town just sell them to the open market? Because then I don't think we would have affordable housing on them. I think the way that the town can get affordable housing is either to subsidize it or just um, allow it to be developed privately on private property. But in this case, we have an asset, which is the property, and it can be given away um, if the town chooses to do that. Um, otherwise, affordable housing is always built um, at a loss. And so there has to be a subsidy that comes in somewhere um, we're looking for an affordable housing developer that could provide their own fundraising, um, their own ability to construct a home, their own ability to get through the permitting without the town having to make any kind of financial contribution. Otherwise, towns are often asked for a financial contribution for affordable housing if it's built on town land. As to the question of why it never was um, conveyed pre previously, why it was zoned in 2008 for this, but never given to a developer. I don't, I don't know why, why so many years went by without any action on it. But, but I, I'm sorry, just to, to thank you for that answer. My question is, why wouldn't we just sell it on the, on the open market and then potentially use that land sale to develop housing, affordable housing in another area? I think because this is, um, it was zoned specifically for affordable housing, um, in order to make these properties fully developable, the zoning had to be altered to make 
to make affordable housing possible, um, these are otherwise properties that would, would have had some issues either with size, and that's why they're not just in a regular zoning district there. It's an incentive to a developer to develop a, for affordable housing. If we were just interested in selling them on the open market, um, it, would, it just wouldn't help us meet our goals for affordable housing. It's just really, really difficult to find sites where, where, where housing can be developed that the town is actually interested in seeing developed and that abutters would accept. I, I know that abutters don't want to really, you know, don't want it to be um, near them, of course, but um, it's really, really hard to identify these sites. These sites were already identified, and so that's why they're here. Okay, thank you. That's my question. There's a couple more comments I just want to read, and then we can go to uh, back back again to any further discussion or deliberation. Um, with regard to the previous comment that I read from Kyle Todd, there's additional comment from Megan Hafner that agrees with his comment. We would like to see more information before this goes to vote. And from Kyle Todd, with regard to the discussion about why uh, would it would why would it why wouldn't we just sell it? I believe the property would would first have to be rezoned before it could be sold on that basis. From Christina, at the last meeting, a number of us expressed concerns over the traffic issues at the intersection of Haverhill Street and Chestnut Street. Will a traffic study be done so we can understand? what impact the 57 Haverhill Street proposal would have and when would that occur? Danielle, if you can um, answer that. Sure, so there, there's no rezoning proposed. All of these properties were already zoned in 2008 to allow exactly what they're being proposed for now. Um, so we would only accept proposals that were in accordance with the zoning as it is today. Um, and then um, with regard to the safety at Haverhill and Chestnut Street, yes, that's definitely a concern that, that um, people brought up. I know the DPW is in the midst of a traffic study right now that, that is looking at, at that intersection for possible improvements. I don't expect it to be ready for the public. I've heard that it could be you know, a month before um, it's actually complete. Um, in terms of a traffic study, um, the CPC normally does require traffic studies for, um, for projects of, you know, more than a, it's usually commercial projects or very large residential projects. I mean, I think for a project of, you know, for one to, you know, four or four to six units, um, they probably would be unlikely to require a new traffic study. But of course, we're very mindful of the safety aspect of it. And so um, I think we would, we, we would have, that would, of course, be considered as part of the public hearing. I don't know if Mr. Pierce wanted to mention anything about the need for a traffic study for a project of that size. Mr. Pierce? If I may, uh, the, uh, do you, uh, Madam Chair, I, I think that um, she's correct that in a small project, if you're building a single family or a two family house uh, traffic study, th th it wouldn't produce enough traffic to affect the, the, uh, the traffic on that street whatsoever. So, um, so on a larger project where we would have a lot of cars entering and exiting, yes, absolutely a traffic study, but we're not talking about that kind of a project size here. Okay, I just want to follow up on. I just want to follow up on your answer also to Mr. Walner, Danielle, and what the CPC proposed and put on the warrant is for these these particular projects to be developed by a developer for affordable housing because of an overlay district. But if the town were to sell this land, um, you know, in a regular sale. What is the underlying zoning that applies? Can these are these buildable, and what type of um, zoning is applicable if the town were to just sell the lots? Now, I'm not saying that's what the town's mm -hmm. doing, but I think that's more directed to what Mr. Wall is asking you. Mm -hmm. um, Seven San Teresa is, I believe, that's residence B. It's definitely um, a conforming lot, whether it's residence A or B. But I believe it's B. You you could put a single family house on that. You might even be able to subdivide it and put more than one house on it. Um, Oakdale at twenty thousand square feet. I believe that's also residence B, and that would be one conforming house lot. And that's pretty much what we're looking at for Oakdale anyway. Is one conforming house lot. Um, Fifty seven Haverhill Street is residence A. Um, that property is bigger, and 
as far as how many, I, I can't really answer how many would go on that because a chunk of it, about a third of it is wetland and, and wouldn't be built on anyway. Um, so it's a little hard for me to answer exactly how many units could go on that. It might be subdividable to get more than you know one, maybe two or three units possibly, yeah. but we'd have to look at that a little further. Okay. Now, Ms. Mr. Yes, Mr. Pierce. And then we're gonna to go to Ms. Mike, Mike D after, after Mr. Pierce. This is one of the reasons why she was suggesting that we that we handle 57 Havel Street that way, because what would happen is that uh, the wetlands would be flagged, the developer would put the engineering into deciding, you know, how many, uh, you know, what they could actually fit on that property, and then when you brought it to to town meeting, you'd be able to say precisely what uh, what the possibilities are, as opposed to, you know, maybes, uh, and that's why she's proposed that. I think that's a good plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Who's proposing what? Well, I well, yeah, well, Danielle was proposing to uh, to do the RFP and then bring it to town, bring it to town meeting. Uh, oh. Okay, but this okay. is already on the warrant. So this is coming to a vote because yeah. it's already a warrant article. So uh, right. that's why right. we're, we're, we already put this process in motion. CPC already put this process in motion by having right. three articles on the warrant. So. Yeah. Let's let me let me just go back to one more thing for Danielle. Danielle, you said you were looking at a single family house on Oakdale. What else has been presented to you for potential plans for these other two lots? Um, one or two family house for St. Teresa. Um, and for 57 Haverhill, it's it it's it's still a question because of the issues that we mentioned. Um, but the limit to what the zoning would allow is it's special permit would allow up to eight units um, in a multifamily development. Um, but that's not, we're not looking at a project of that size. It would be smaller, but I can't tell you exactly how many because um, there are some questions about that property. Um, and, and based on the comments from the neighborhood, we are understanding that the neighborhood is, is not comfortable with that uncertainty of between one and eight units. They're not really comfortable with that. And I think that they would maybe prefer to know more specifically what the proposal ends up being. And for that property in particular, it really does depend on the conditions because of the wetlands. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Mr. Um, Mike D, you're muted. Good, good evening, Mike Tachara, 34 Heritage Way. Uh, I want to thank uh, Danielle and I want to thank you uh, for your meeting, but I, I just want to bring up one thing and Mr. Pierce brought it up as well. We don't really know and I'm talking about regarding 57 Haverhill. We don't know how many units are planned. We pretty much don't know anything about the, uh, the, the exact planning of it. So we can't say that it won't impact traffic depending on the vehicles. If you put two or three units in there, two, three, four, five. So I, uh, my, uh, my fellow residents on uh, Chestnut and Haverhill Street do have concerns for traffic as we all do. My concern with a lot of my residents on uh, uh, Heritage Way is the wetlands. Uh, years back, there was a similar issue brought up about some development on Haverhill Street and it was flagged down a, a main company, but uh, it went before the Wetlands Commission and they backed us up and you can better check the records. There is substantial amount of water. Nobody's against affordable housing and so forth like that. But I think the way this was presented, we don't know enough. This is, this is one of the largest lots. We really don't have a lot of information. We don't really know the impact. So it's kind, you know, I would have hoped that before this was brought up for conveyance, that we could have had a little more information uh, on it. I just want to go on the record saying that because it is it is complex. We don't know. And like Danielle said, she doesn't know how many units. Uh, so I do like, and Mr. Pierce uh, also alluded to the fact that if, if we did have an RFP and there was a plan before we went to vote on the conveyance, we'd have a better idea and you might get more favorability and so forth, the feasance of it. But the feasibility, since I've been a resident for quite some time, is that everything out back is a marshland. And if wetlands are diverted in the wrong direction, it could not only impact my house, but all the residents in a heritage way as well. So uh, I just want to go on record as saying that, and I support my neighbors, and I thank you for the comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tashara. All right, do we have any other hands raised? Uh, yes, I do. Mr. Atkinson. Yes. Uh, in a, in essentially, given my location as not a direct abutter, uh, my concern is primarily with traffic. 
Uh, I use that Chestnut Street intersection quite frequently to visit my brother at one Powder Hill Road in Linfield at the um, where, where we cross the line into Linfield and also on my way out to I-93. Um, so uh, that would be my biggest concern. And I'm hoping that the traffic study that's already in progress would give us some more information on the impact. But given that uh, we don't know when that study will be completed, that would be my concern. I guess my biggest suggestion is I'd like to see maybe this delayed until June town meeting passed over at town meeting for future consideration in June. And that's about all I have to say on that. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Mr. O'Leary. Oh, okay. All right. Any other? Uh, oh, Jinsu, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't see you. Nice. Welcome. Good evening, Kate. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Everyone, um, can we, Kate? Can we have an introduction of everyone from the town side of the staff? I've this. I've moved into the town five years ago. Uh, it's a pleasure of meeting you all. You all of you. I joined the meeting at eight o'clock. Um, I just just trying to get to know everyone before uh, I speak. Sure. My name is Kate Manupelli. I'm the chair of the select board. Why don't we have the select board introduce yourselves? I'm Vin Vincenzo Studo. I'm Rich Ballner. Leanne, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Leanne Gonzalez. And I'm Steve O'Leary. We have, we're also joined by our CPC chair and our town planner and our town administrator. Why don't you guys in introduce yourselves? Warren, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm Warren Pierce, chairman of the planning board. Hey, Warren. Hey. I'm Danielle McKnight, town planner. And Michael Gilberto, town administrator. Great. Great. So, um, <clears throat> So, so uh, this morning I had an email exchange with uh, uh, town planner Daniel McKnight. Before uh, before I say anything, Daniel, uh, thank you for the really quick response this morning and uh, throughout the communication process. And Warren, Daniel has been uh, really great at responding to my question and emails, and as well as the neighborhood around the Heritage Way. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, the email uh, that I had. I had an exchange with uh, Daniel this morning. Uh, most of the questions were answered. There was one question, the last one, uh, about the survey map, survey map that was showing the wetlands and the buffer zone. And uh, the Heritage Way is not on the map. I'm not sure, if Daniel, if you saw the email. I, I did, and I'm sorry I hadn't had a chance to respond yet. Heritage Way is directly below that area. Um, and I can, tomorrow if you'd like, I can um, sort of try to help you picture where, because Heritage Way is not on that map, it, it's south of it. So I can, if you'd like, I'd be happy to um, get in touch tomorrow to try to explain it a bit better. Yeah, just, just trying to get an idea of um, where the 100 feet buffer is from the uh, Heritage Way, the entire neighborhood. Uh, since we are talking about the wetlands, and uh, I, I just move into the neighborhood, I, a lot of things are unknown to me, and um, my good neighbors are filling in for filling in for me all the information. So that would be great. Um, I have uh, other couple of questions. Is that I think Kay, um, you answered the question of the selection process. Three sites out of twenty-three sites that were selected, it wasn't by town; it was by it was by the uh, really by the developer or uh, natural habitat group, um, and I think the RFP process. I think that's called request for proposal. Okay, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay, as you can tell, I'm I'm still learning the acronyms here. So um, the last question I have, actually, I have a couple more. Uh, I do echo Gary and Heidi's voice about uh, removing that uh, from the on the ballot uh, on October fourth, uh, I heard what you I heard what you said, um, and I, I I do echo their voice because there's some information that's still missing that we're trying to understand about the wetland 
And after the development, uh, what, what's going to happen with the water and the situation? So it, it, it's, it's unknown to me and uh, to my wife. And uh, the, the neighborhood from 30, 32, 34, uh, two, three, uh, four, six Heritage Way, and as well as across the street, my neighbor, um, they all, they all, um, they all, they all impacted on this one potentially. So um, that's that. And well, if we can have more information uh, going forward, that would be great. Well, thank you for um, joining us. Welcome to the community, and thank you for participating. And did you have any other questions you wanted to ask? The last one, and when it comes to vote, who will vote? Is it going to be the entire town or just going to be in the neighborhood? Okay, so this is a really important thing that we've heard. Can we, can we just pass over this article? Can we just put it off? So real, it's really important for everybody attending to understand that these three articles were put on the warrant by the CPC. I forgot to introduce Abigail Hurl, but she's from the finance. She's the chair of the finance committee. She's joining us as well. The select board has not made a recommendation on this and neither has the finance committee. These are CPC um, items that were placed on the warrant. Dollar. These are generated by the CPC. This, the select board hasn't made a recommendation, but even if it doesn't, even if the finance committee doesn't, does make a recommendation anyway on this, whether we decide we're against it, in favor of it, or to pass it over. The voters who show up at the town meeting carry the day on whether or not this passes, fails, or is passed over depending on the recommendation. And the voters decide. So you have to go, registered voters have to go attend the town meeting and take a stand by voting on this. And even if we're in disagreement on things, the number of voters that show up and make a vote on it matters. So what Danielle is explaining, one of these going by two thirds, two thirds vote versus a majority means two thirds of the individuals that show up to the town meeting have to take us decide. And the board is just making a recommendation and of course, we're allowed to vote as registered voters with the town showing up in the town meeting as well. But it depends on what the voters decide to do on these articles. So even if the recommendation is no, pass over it, the voters could that show up could still carry the day and approve this. Or the voters could still show up and carry the day on denying this. It's up to the voters at town meeting. All we do is make a recommendation. So That's again, this is, this is CPC driven articles and you've heard a little bit more just like the board has this evening and the finance committee members that are joining us this evening have heard a little bit more from this informational hearing on how this came about and why and and that does that answer your question on uh yes it sounds like uh, the voters from the entire town who's registered is going to vote that, that would be ideal, but that's not usually what shows up. We have more people joining us than would that sometimes even go to the meeting. So usually it's basically the, you know, it's basically the same people. So we encourage people, even though this is an informational hearing, we encourage people, you have to still go to the town meeting. We don't get a big turnout. We don't, we're not a big draw. But on issues like this that are very important to neighbors and abutters and people that want to preserve the community that's when we seem to get a lot of people at town meeting. So you still have to go and you still have to vote. So, so yes, it would be nice if all the registered voters go. And one of our things that we'd like is to encourage more, more people to attend the town meeting, but we don't get a lot of big turnout. So hopefully this will bring up, bring more people out to vote. I, I'd love to see you all. And if from this property, uh, from this issue um, that we're concerning about, um, I, I believe that uh, the only, I believe the people who go to vote are not, um, I, I hope the people who go to vote is the one that's impacted. Um, the voters that are actually not impacted by this property uh, who vote um, are probably not uh, significantly, uh, have significant interest uh, on this one. 
and uh, if they vote, they will dilute the uh, the vote from my understanding. Is that correct? I don't know where everyone stands. I only know where what I hear tonight and my fellow colleagues on the board. Uh, we only know what we hear tonight where people stand. And we each would make our own vote. There's five of us on the board, select board. There's a larger committee on the finance committee, but we each have a difference of opinion on, this, on these articles. And okay. it's it, it, very different, but what happens with the select board recommendation and the finance committee recommendation, it's based on what the majority of the board votes. So if three people vote in favor of us and the other two of us are opposed to it, opposed to recommending it, this recommendation comes out to the to the town meeting floor as recommended by the board on a three, two vote. So we have, we have the opportunity to stand and tell you why we're opposed to it or why we're in favor of it. Just like town, everyone in the town who votes and has an opportunity to stand up at the town meeting and explain their position. So it, it does, I understand it has a direct impact on, on the abutters, but certainly development of town owned parcels has an impact on the town at large too. So it's important for everybody to come in and be heard about you know, what happens with this town owned land. So I think that's, I understand the direct abutters it obviously impacts significantly, but it also has an impact on the rest of us too, seeing, the, seeing these modifications to these lots. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Right. Thanks, thank Mike, and thank much. you, Warren, for the answer to all the questions. Please go to town meeting. <laughs> Come to the town meeting. All right, so we have a couple more hands. Before we get to um, Mr. Blanche and Mr. McGowan, I just want to read some additional comments that were written because we're trying to give put them all into the record here. Is Jeff to Jeff commenting, it is my understanding, speaking with long-term residents, that the intersection of Hayesville and Chestnut has always been an issue. Has it been studied, ever been studied prior? Does do Danielle or anyone know? If you could raise your hand and answer. Has that intersection been studied before? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know it's being studied now, but I don't know the history of it. Madam Chair, through you, that, that's Mr. great. Yeah. It, is un, it is under study right now for both short and long-term improvements, in, including uh, potential uh, signal if necessary at the, uh, at the intersection. I do believe that it has been, the intersection has been modified over the years and the alignment has been modified and that's likely the result of studies that were done, but uh, they, they would likely be fairly dated and not reflect today's traffic counts. Okay, thank you. So uh, Madam Chair. Mr. O'Leary. Yes. Yeah, there, there no, we studies. should go to our historian on the board. No, yeah, no, there, there has been studies on that intersection. Uh, and again, the population of the community has changed substantially. The traffic patterns have changed substantially. And to Mr. Gilberto's point that he made that the uh, there was a, an al alteration to the, uh, to the intersection uh, years ago uh, as a re result of a study, but also as a direct result of um, a fatal accident where several members of a family were were killed uh, at that site. So yes, it's been studied, but the last time it was studied was probably 25 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe. And, uh, and again, the, the traffic patterns have certainly changed. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Pierce has been around as long as longer oh, than I have. <laughs> anything, all right. And then here's another- Excuse me, Mr. Pierce had his hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pierce. Anything you to add? Well, I didn't see your hand up. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was I was going to mention that. Yeah, there was. Uh, first of all, many years ago, there was that bad accident. And then they put the flashing light up, and um, they didn't have the flashing light there before. And then they came later on and modified the turn that the the intersection on Haverhill Street. So there has been. I, but what I was going to say is I don't know that there was actual studies done. I think these are just respond. And I think that's what Steve alluded to as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pierce. I just wanna to get to the two more comments. Another comment by Kyle Todd. In addition, the property immediately to the side of 57 Haverhill is not on the map and that property is a marsh. So the wetlands are far more extensive than the current map would indicate. And from Heidi Weiberg Hastings, for 57 Haverhill, it's on a majority. It's very important and on a majority means that there isn't a higher standard. It's 
one more than half is a majority. So for 57 Haverhill, the vote is on a majority. It's very important that anyone who's concerned about this show up at town meeting. Okay, and so let me go to Mr. Blanche and then we'll go to you, Mr. McGowan. Mr. Blanche. Good evening, uh, Good can evening. you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I appreciate all the work going into this. Um, I'm a resident of uh, Heritage Way as well. Um, I'm a unique situation. I don't abut the property, but I do drain into uh, the area from when the house was built. Um, and so I do have uh, currently some issues with water already. Um, so there will be some you know, direct consequence if there is any wetland changes. Um, so I'm certainly concerned and I want to voice, you know, uh, support for the neighborhood. I appreciate all my neighbors uh, adding in tonight. Um, I did have a question regarding kind of clarification. Uh, you mentioned the Passover on the vote, which it sounds like you're, it's either a vote or a Passover. So I just want to get clarification, if you could please, um, who would vote on a Passover and how that works. And then specifically, I guess, just to follow that point, if it's not passed over and it is a, it then becomes a go or no go, which is based on the town votes. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So if, for example, if the if the select board recommends that it be passed over, and the finance committee recommends that it be is against it, the vote still goes to the town to the floor. So it's still it's still voted on. If both select board and finance committee vote against it community planning recommends it still goes to a vote if so community planning is the proponent and is is already on record in the warrant is recommending all of these mm -hmm. so the only other two that need to take a vote on it are the finance committee and the select board regardless of what these three boards do it's coming to a vote either to pass over it to approve of it or to vote it down. So it's coming to a vote of the town meeting, regardless. Okay. You can't just, we can't, in other words, it's on the warrant. So it's got to be decided by the, the members of the town meeting, the voters that show up one but way the or the other. But just to clarify, so the voters would be the ones who would go for a no or a Passover or yes, those are the three options on the ballot. That's correct. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, they're not, it's not a ballot. It's a vote. The a vote. It's, the, it's the article. The article is as it is written and in the warrant. And right now, so far, only the community um, community planning, right? Danielle, all three are recommended by community planning commission, which is the sponsor. The other two have to make a recommendation. Regardless of that, it's coming to a vote. So, um, you know, we obviously the people on the finance committee live here and our voters and the people on the select board live here and our voters. So we obviously are part of that vote, but we don't decide it. The town decides the town, the town voter rules decides this. Okay. Whether, whether to pass it over, whether to, whether to approve it, whether to not to approve it, it's up to the town voters. Okay, thank All you. Right. All right, thank you, Mr. McGowan. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of clarifying questions. One is on that same topic. As I understand, as I've observed passing over motions in the past, the meetings in the past, uh, a, rec a motion to pass over the warrant is made if that's the desire of the uh, uh, the select board, I, I guess, right? If, if that's what you want to do. And then the town votes on that motion to pass over. In my experience, that has always passed and the, mo and the, and the article's passed over. But if, if the town votes against the motion to pass over, it would then move to the actual article. Is that right? That's exactly correct, okay. yes. Just, I, just yes. I think that's, hopefully that's clarifying to some who kind of missed that functional part. And the other one is a simple question. If the land is conveyed to, um, uh, in this in this manner, and 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 ultimately, uh, a project is never approved, or uh, they can't get the permitting, or they or they decide there's it's it's not a project they can pursue. Uh, what happens to the property? This is, is it, yeah. Um, 
what we would want to do is, um, and we would indicate this in the RFP, um, we would we would want it after a certain amount of time if the project was not built um, to revert back to the town. At least that would would be you know our recommendation to structure it that way. Um, that would be something that would need to be reviewed by town council. But we wouldn't want these properties to just be conveyed and then um, sit and never um, never be built. So, okay. and I just want to make a clarification, Mr. McGowan, with regard to, in a general sense, what you were explaining as the process, but for those in attendance, let's be very, very clear here. These were put on the warrant by the CPC, which has already recommended it. So the motion on the floor at the town meeting for all of these articles, which are going to come one by one, is to recommend. So that's what's going to be on the floor for the town to vote. Does You'll hear when the article comes up, the presentation by the CPC, the motion, and then what happens is the, someone from the select board will be called up to give the select board's recommendation. Someone from the finance committee will be called up to give the finance committee's recommendation. And then there'll be discussion by members of the community that are there to vote. So the motions on these three articles are going to be recommend by the CPC. So that's what will be on the town floor. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, all right. So, um, yes, okay. A couple more comments um, on this one for Kate. I may have missed it, could someone clarify why 57 Haverhill is majority vote versus two thirds on the other par properties in consideration. I missed it too. So, and I, I think that there needs to be more clarification on that. And I know that there was some talk about talking with town council on why that is. Mr. Gilberto, if you could thank, answer that. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, so first we'll, we'll get a detailed answer to that question out to, to those on the uh, call through some of the uh, email addresses that have come in. But my understanding, and Mr. O'Leary can confirm, is that uh, this is tied to the manner in which the town acquired the property. So my understanding is we did not purchase the property when we acquired it. We instead swapped land with the town of Reading in the acquisition. And I believe the land that we swapped is actually the location of the current substation behind the DPW where the electricity comes into town here. So I, I believe that that is what's triggering the change in the quantum of the vote. We didn't actually pay any money when we bought the land. We traded land with Reading Light. Uh, but Madam Chair, through you, we'll get the detailed answer out to folks just to confirm that fact. Um, and uh, through you, I, I would ask if uh, Mr. O'Leary has anything to add. He probably knows the, the history on that. Just to, first of all, the other two parcels were taken for tax title. That was mm -hmm. non-payment of taxes. So when, when the town acquires property through tax title, there's a different process which requires a two-thirds vote of town, meaning to get it from the custodian to the board of selectmen in order to convey it to somebody else. The parcel of 57 uh, Haverhill Street, again, was part of a land swap with another parcel down on Haverhill Street, a little bit further south on the opposite side of the street. Reading Ispolite bought a single family home. Uh, I forget what number Haverhill Street, but very low number Haverhill Street, uh, just north of uh, Scotland Road. They bought that particular parcel and they already had custody of this parcel. They came to, they were going to put the substation at where that single family home was located. It was going to tear it down and put a substation in there. The board at the time said that would be ugly and terrible and unsightly coming up Haverhill Street, having a substation right there on, on, on Haverhill Street. We have a site at the DPW out of sight that would be willing to swap. Give us those two parcels and we'll give you enough land to build your substation, which is what occurred. So the, the manner in which we acquired it, which was through a land swap, not tax title, to convey it would only take a majority vote. To authorize the Board of Selectmen to convey the property and sell it, it only requires a, a simple majority. So that's why that one's different. And I think what's important for people to understand, that even if these articles pass, it still has to go through the Board of Selectmen or the Select Board in order to convey it to somebody else and another public hearing. And again, as far as you know, what's being asked of us uh, is to, you're being asked to authorize the select board to convey this property to somebody else. That somebody else has to be a developer of affordable housing because these three parcels are included in the affordable uh, housing zone, which was passed in 2008. 
So in order for us to convey it and have it be developed, it has to be for affordable housing purposes. And how we go about doing that, again, we would certainly uh, uh, would strongly consider what being asked of us right now by the Community Planning Commission, again, their job is to outline their vision for what the community should look like moving forward, which should include affordable housing, which is why we have these 23 parcels throughout the community. So each and every one of those 23 parcels have to go through the same thing. The town meeting has to authorize the board, select board, give us the authority to convey it for affordable housing purposes. So it's not done in a vacuum. Town meeting has to give us approval to dispose of it. When, if and when we dispose of it is entirely up to the select board. What it would be used for is for affordable housing purposes only. So it still has a few more steps to go. Uh, so it's important if people are overly concerned, again, my question, first question would be to, to, to Warren, uh, the chairman of the Community Planning Commission, is it the intention of the Planning Commission to recommend passing over the article specific to 57 Haverhill Street? And not, not at this time, because we did vote to recommend, as Ms. Mancapelli pointed out. So that is correct. We, we, we'll probably go and still recommend uh, if the select board wanted to recommend passing over. But um, the case you just made is one of the reasons why we recommended, because we know that this is not the final step. And that by getting the ability to put them out from RFP, um, we can get input from developers to find out what could be done, you know, if anything, um, and what it, what it would look like. And that would give us something to bring back to the board to say, okay, this is what we got from, from uh, uh, the proposals that we got to do this, the, these, this particular type of development, uh, you know, one house, two houses, whatever. And uh, as you just, as you mentioned, the select board has the option of not agreeing with it and not, not voting for it. So um, there's quite a bit of protection here. But it's going to be difficult to decide exactly what can be done until we get a developer involved who um, can put the whole project together and say, okay, here's what can be done here. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward for the, for, for the other two, you know, the small lots. Well, it, well, St. Teresa's Road has a little bit of room, but still, those are going to be small projects, regardless of what it is. What single house on one, maybe two on another at the most. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. And I think it's important for those in attendance to know that Mr. O'Leary was not speaking on behalf of the board or on the board's position on this. He was offering one position with regard to these lots of land and their fate. All right. So let me just um, read a, a couple more of these things. I think I lost count. Okay. Rich and Walner, our select board member did say my understanding is because 57 was the result of the land so which you just heard from Mr. O'Leary confirmed from Mr. O'Leary. Kyle Todd we appreciate that there are additional steps in the process before houses would be built on 57 Haverhill but for the neighbors who are already dealing with wetlands and flooding issues there is no solution that would overcome the simple reality that the land cannot be developed without damaging the Heritage Way neighborhood. Jing Chu said, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Mike, Steve. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Danielle. Warren, appreciate for staying late and all the answers. My five and a half year old daughter loves the land and forest, same as the rest of my family. Look forward to seeing you on 10-4. Thank you. All right, Mr. Deshara. Yes, quick question. Uh, I, I don't want to tie up the floor. Uh, but no, question. this is uh, why we have these 20, meetings. So this is really helpful. Properties. Yeah, but uh, can I ask a question, probably to uh, direct it to Mr. Pierce. How come three properties were selected out of the 23 and why, why weren't there other properties? If, if, he's with, if I understood him right, if you're checking the feasibility of building certain sites, is that the reason why you picked these three? Or should you have, could you have picked more and why, why were these three sites uh, selected, if I, if I may ask? Well, they were, they were um, Habitat for Humanity came in and, and they kind of, uh, Mentioned that they could that that these are properties that they could that they could probably do something with, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Danielle, but I believe they're the ones that started us down this path. That's correct. So um, you know, so uh, so correct me if 
if I'm wrong, uh, you I'm will- I'm having have a hard time coach. hearing everyone. Just one second, just wait. Just give it a couple of seconds because okay. I'm losing the connection there. All right, Mr. Pierce, were you all set with that yes, explanation? Yes, I'm ready. He can, uh, he can ask the question. Okay, Mr. Deshara. Okay, so you said you already approached by Habitat for Humanities selected these sites out of the 23? Yeah, they. I believe they looked them over and thought these two are ones that they could do something with. So, um, and, and again, that, that's a good group and it doesn't, but, but they're not necessarily going to get them. In, in other words, once this, uh, once the, the um, town meeting votes to release these, they still have to go out for an RFP and any developer that's willing to, to meet the conditions that are in the RFP, which is to develop affordable housing, I would have the option of bringing forth a, a project or, or, a, or, you know, or an RFP, a, a proposal to us. Uh, but Habitat Humanity would probably also be there, and we can and we can choose what we think is ultimately the town should choose what's best for the town. And you know, we need the affordable housing. That's why the overlay district exists, and and to um, create that overlay and then not take advantage of it, then not use it you know, would be probably not the best thing to do. So I think we should, uh, uh, that, that's why we put it together the way we did. And Habitat okay. Humanity will, will, would obviously do, uh, has a reputation for doing quality work. Oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm not done in the organization. Right, thank you, Mr. Pierce, for that point of clarification. I just wanted to, I've, I've been asked this question by a lot of people that are involved. Yeah. How come these, these three properties out of 23 were picked? But uh, thank you and thank you, Kate. No okay. problem. And we have just one more comment from Heidi Weiberg Hastings. These were picked because the developer saw them as easiest to build. Okay. And I don't know if there's any other comment from the members or those in attendance with regard to this. Nothing. <laughs> Head shaking. Okay. All right. So let's, um, so I think the final for the, for the select board and the finance committee, the final um, recommendation or decision on this would be at the town meeting. And then we'll each actually have the opportunity to stand up and give our position on what we think the fate of the land should be as well. So, okay, I think we can move on to the next. Um, I just have, I just have one quick question. As far as the participation level last Thursday and I'm Sorry, I wasn't able to participate. Um, how many people, how many comments? I'm just curious as to how many people actually uh, contacted you, Danielle, and participated have, in that. I, I'd have to do a count of the number of the people on the call. I would say we probably had 30 on the call. I can confirm that with uh, you. I just and yeah. yeah, and I've received emails maybe from another eight people right. beyond that. It was, uh, what about interest level in each property? I mean, obviously Haverhill Street had the most significant level of participation and level of questions, raising concerns regarding the wetlands. What about uh, Oakdale Road extension and uh, St. Teresa Street? As far I as heard questions. from, I think two on Oakdale and two on St. Teresa. Okay. Um, one for St. Teresa was, um, ha had concerns and would prefer to either not see it developed or if it was developed with like a single family rather than a two family. Another was actually interested in being a recipient of the RFP because she um, uh, had interest in developing the property herself. Um, for Oakdale, I, uh, one of the comments was prefer a single family if something would be developed but prefer nothing to be developed and the other I don't have in front of me, um, but the vast majority of the comments were on the Hayville Street. And then in relation to what was presented to the to the public, uh, are we talking about these um, residences, proposed residents to be for purchase or for rental? So- Or would it depend the, on the RFP? It, it would depend on the RFP. I, we, as we, as it has been mentioned, we were approached by Habitat. I, I know that um, if they are chosen, it would be a home ownership model. Um, and you know, um, in terms of rental, I, I would hesitate to recommend a situation where the town retained ownership but was renting it out to, you know, to to tenants. Um, I think that would present some other difficulties. But, but those I'm not are saying the town rented. I'm saying a town offer for development for affordable housing, which oh. would become rental. Uh, oh, I understand. Um, 
I, that's something that could be addressed in the RFP, um, but it isn't something that the CPC has specifically discussed. Yeah, we get it. I think that's important as to what is the CPC presenting to us for consideration? Is it home ownership or is it investment for, for a nonprofit for rental purposes? Uh, that would probably be of interest to people also. Okay. Uh, and then um, just to, and again, to, to as far as the wetlands go, um, does the Planning Commission, I guess it's to you or Danielle, it's in relation to some of these um, parcels that are in the affordable housing zone or district, um, why wouldn't we do the uh, wetlands demarcations ourselves? You know, hire an independent person so that, you know, there's no question as to, uh, and again, people have to understand that, you know, while the developer's paying for it, as Mr. Pierce pointed out, these have to be qualified partners and individuals, you know, who certify things. And then we have our own conservation agent who goes over it also, and at times hire outside consultants to verify what they've done. So the, the public can be rest assured that the Conservation Commission, Conservation Agent, and the community as a whole hires wetlands specialists to, to double check the work. Um, but I mean, in relation to some of these parcels, you know, why wouldn't we do that ahead of time in order to get a better understanding as to what we would be requesting for proposals for? May I? Go ahead, Ms. Um, yes, sure. please. I, I, I would be very happy to coordinate that. Um, we would just need to have a, a funding source to, to, to pay our own wetlands consultant. And if one could be identified, I, I certainly would be happy to coordinate that for, for all of these properties. Well, I, I think as we move forward, and even in, as we consider these proposals, I mean, that's what's a, I mean, people are concerned about having new housing in their neighborhoods. But as far as, you know, what would be allowed there based upon, and again, most of these parcels, a lot of these parcels, if not all of them, have some form of wetlands associated with them. You know, why wouldn't we want to know what the limitations are going to be before we even ask for a request for proposal? I think that question was posed about 30 minutes ago, Mr. O'Leary. And I don't think, I think the answer was it was going to be left up to a developer as far as these are. Well, I mean, that's what the, that's what the philosophy yeah, that, that was today. already actually asked. That was already that, asked. That was today. Answered before. Yes. But right. we just said that they're willing to take, consider doing that with a source of funding. And to me, I would propose that uh, if you have parcels like these, that you want to propose the town meeting to turn over to the custody of the select board to do, we should have that information in hand and seek the funding for it. Because I'd be happy to, to vote in favor of that and ask town meeting to vote in favor of that, you know, the funding source so that at least we know what's going to be proposed there rather than waiting for uh, a developer to propose something to us. Mm -hmm. If I may, Ms. Well, I, I again, I think our our determination on what we're going to do with the recommendation. Very every five of five members of the select board have five very, very different ideas about these warrant articles. But right now, we're here to, to to get some more information. Certainly about that. That that is clearly not what's proposed in the warrant article. It's easy to see that what is being proposed and recommended here. So. It, it already is proposed to leave it up to the, the developer to get that study done. So, and we already talked about that at great length because the residents had question about that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Sutherland who's had his hand raised uh, for comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. Uh, I have a procedural question. I don't know if this will go to Mr. Galberto or if you could answer this. Is it, possible, is it possible to make an amendment on the warrant article at the meeting that would limit the number of properties or the type of home that could be put, put on any of the respective properties? Madam Chair. Mr. Gilberto. Through you, yes it is. Um, yeah, anybody from the floor town meeting can offer an amendment. And in fact, I, I think that even if a, the, the, a main motion were put forth to approve these articles, it would likely have some restriction in it to reflect some of the conversations that have been had already, but um, any amendment could be offered to eliminate whether it be you know number of units or um, some other limitation, uh, and it would be subject to approval on the floor town meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, we're a uh, direct of butters to the 4446 Oakdale Road property. We have a fair amount of wetlands too, but we are you know it's kind of at some point and and for the select board to consider we have to start producing our own affordable housing before somebody decides it for us. 
Um, so, you know, we, and it seems like most of the, you know, uh, Mr. O'Leary, you kind of mentioned the Oakdale neighborhood, the general feeling and why you probably don't see a ton of attendance here is I think people are going, we have to put it somewhere. And as long as it fits the neighborhood, the, the neighborhood kind of seems on board. So especially if it can be limited to that type, um, I think there's a lot of people that are in favor of that type of development. We see what's going on on Elm Street and we don't want somebody coming in later and deciding for us. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sutherland. Before I get to Ms. M Mrs. Manley, just adding these, uh, Mrs. Manley's actually added in the comment, where is North Reading in terms of meeting the 10% affordable housing requirement? How many more units are needed? And then Jeremy Blamp said, great suggestion, Mr. O'Leary, which I think refers to a study. I think that's maybe when it was posted. Ms. Manley, you're muted. You're yeah, muted, Ms. Manley. You're Sorry. Muted. Yeah, I did have so my go question. Back to rewind. Go back to the <laughs> beginning of that. Sorry, I did have my question in the chat about the 10% that I'd like to know, but I, I do echo Jeremy's sentiment about a great suggestion by Mr. O'Leary. It does seem like we don't have a ton of information to be able to, you know, there's those of us on this meeting right now, but then other people that would be voting at town meeting, we don't have a ton of information to go by. And to be having the developer make these decisions for us does seem um, a little backwards in the process. But I would also like to know about the 10%. Okay, Mr. Gilberto or actually Ms. McKnight could probably address that one. Um, currently our subsidized housing inventory uh, shows that we have 9.6% uh, affordable housing, which is a gap of 22 units. Those are 2010 census numbers. The 2020 census is in the process of being released. Um, we don't have our confirmation yet of our housing numbers. Um, it's projected that we will have, instead of a gap of 22, a gap of around 50 when we do get the 2020 numbers released. So we are expected to have um, a larger um, affordable housing gap when those numbers are released. Oh, okay. Mrs. Manley, are you all set? Yep. All right. Okay, so Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner's next. Go ahead, Mr. Walner, you are muted. Yeah, there we go. Just it's important to realize though that the Edgewood apartments uh, in 2038 fall off of that number. So we have, to, it sounds like 2038 is far away, but it's really not that far away. So we do have to be active in building our affordable housing. So, just so we're aware. And, and Madam Chair, that number is 406 units. That's what that's going to fall off in 2038. Because that's rental property and it was 40B, 40R, we got credit for all of the units, even though 20% were affordable. But in 2038, that 406 number goes away. And with that 406 units short. And again, we just put on Pulte property, which is going to be a total of 450 units. We need 10% of those, which is 45, which is not included in those census data, the previous census data. So a portion of that will be included in the new numbers. So there's 45 right there that you're going to be short additionally. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Wall, do you have anything else to add to that? No, thank you. All set. Okay. All right. So I think that... I do not see any other hands up with regard to this. And right, any other questions, any other discussion, any other comment? We're good. Uh, Madam Chair, are you gonna be asking the board to make another a recommendation based upon the, we, we, we voted last week or last meeting to wait until we found out what the input was from the public hearing that the planning commission had in our public hearing. <laughs> Were you looking to have us make a recommendation okay. this evening? Uh, I wasn't, but we certainly can. But let me just read one more comment put in by Kyle Todd. Let's buy the parking lot at Ocean State and put up affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would actually then, if if we're going to stop here in the, at this, but lots of space there and it's dry. Not are really. Sure about are you sure about it's that? It's pretty wet over there. <laughs> That's right. Very uh, low. Yes. Um, 
All right. Uh, why don't we? I, I'm sure we can pull the membership if, if we're prepared to, to move forward on a recommendation, even though we were going to do it on the town floor. But why don't I go ahead and pull you if you're ready to uh, um, be heard on this? Mrs. Gonzalez? You're muted. Sorry, my son's band was rehearsing tonight, so I've tried to stay muted. <laughs> um, so um, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and vote to pass over, if I can. Okay, so you're in favor of passing over. Mr. Walner, what's your pleasure? Well, there's three different articles, so um, are we doing each one individually? Oh, that's a good point. Um, you're right. So let's... We're going to go with Article 13, authorized okay. in advance of town-owned land for affordable housing at 57 Haverhill Street. Okay, so on 57, I would pass over. Leanne is, um, and Mrs. Gonzalez is a pass over. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was referring to. <coughs> Mr. Studo, sorry for coughing. Pass over on 57. Mr. And and just clarify, because as Mr. O'Leary mentioned, um, when we talked about it at our last select board meeting, I I wanted to hear from everyone, and it seems like there's there's too many questions <coughs> to make a you know a prudent kind of recommendation, and at the same time saying I took into account what everybody you know in the community was saying. So I just want to add that little note. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Mr. O'Leary. I, I think we should uh, confirm with the Planning Commission moving forward on, a, on these affordable housing uh, parcels. And I think we should adopt a policy where if it's gonna be suggested by the Planning Commission or even the board themselves to convey the property to us for affordable housing purposes, that we do the wetlands delineation and then put out the request, propo request for proposals based upon uh, what can be done there and what we would like to see. So. Yeah, I'm in favor of passing over this article and probably the other two also so that we can um, develop a, a policy. And again, maybe, maybe I'm all, I don't want to say I'll win, but maybe, maybe it's not the right idea, the right approach, but I, I think it's important because these 23 parcels were set aside specifically for specific reasons. All of them have issues. Um, and I think we need to know what those issues are. And if we're going to put out requests for proposals, you know, what can we actually do with them? So, okay. so, uh, so I'm in favor of you know, having a planning commission come before us, come before us and request funds to do the wetlands delineation or anything else they need before it's conveyed and before town meeting does it. So uh, in, in the specific article, I'm in favor of passing it over at this particular time. Okay. All right. And by the way, I'm in favor of affordable housing. I think we have an obligation that we need to meet and we haven't met it. And we're going to have more uh, challenges ahead. And so we have to be cognizant of it and not duck the issue. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Mr. O'Leary. The majority of the board is in favor of passing over. I am completely opposed to recommending Article 13. There are certain places that just there's no development that belongs there. And that's my opinion of Article 13. The area is the, the roadway is well used. We know of the dangerousness there plopping something down on that lot, not even knowing what the wetlands delineation, delineation is and letting someone tell us what we should know about our own land uh, is wrong in my opinion. And there is something to be said for maintaining the open space as it is. And I agree with you, Mr. O'Leary, and I do, I think, I believe all the all our colleagues on the select board share with the same idea that we do need to move forward on uh, taking care of the affordable housing and, and increasing the affordable housing in the community. None of us are opposed to that, but it's the right location. The right location is not this location, in my opinion. This study was done in 2008. Times are changed and so hasn't the community and so hasn't development in the community. And that's just the wrong location. So the majority of the board's in favor of passing over this. So do we do, do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes. I can hear. Madam Chair, I move to pass over 
Article 13, authorized conveyance of town-owned land for affordable housing, 57 Haverhill Street. Second. Uh, Mr. Studo's motion to recommend passing over um, Article 13 uh, and seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Manupelli is no on Passover because Manupelli is vote on no recommend, re recommendation. So the motion to pass over carries four to one. Let's move on to article 14. Authorize conveyance of town owned land for affordable housing at 44 to 46 Oakdale Road. As you know, we did the recommendation to, at town meeting Mrs. Gonzalez, what's your pleasure on Article 14? I will again pass over. Mr. Uh, Walner. Yeah, I'm gonna recommend on this one. Uh, and the reason why is because I have driven by the lot. It's fairly isolated. Um, I also think it would be good to get some experience. And I do trust the, the, uh, the um, process even after, even if the town voted for it, I do trust that the permitting process and the select board will take proper action on this property. So I think we should get the experience. I think we should potentially end up with experience from Habitat from Humanity. And I, I in this one, I think I recommend. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo. I agree with Mr. Walner on this. Um, it's a different, much different than, than the previous. Uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's more clear cut for lack of a better way to put it. Um, so I, um, you know, and also I have not personally been there, but I listened to enough uh, as liaison on the CPC that this one um, I can, I can go with to recommend. All right. So we have Passover recommend, recommend Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, again, I want to be consistent with what I think we should be doing moving forward. So I'm, I'm going to move to recommend passing over this one here. But again, I, I would like the Planning Commission to come in and seek an appropriation to, to do it, uh, do the uh, delineations of the wetlands, and um, then we can move forward on it. So I just want to, I want to start establishing a policy or a directive as to how it, how it should be handled. So I'll be in favor of uh, at this time. And again, I may be in favor of it come June or another time. I'll be in favor of passing over. Okay, so just to make a majority vote, because I would be in favor of not recommending this article, I'm gonna pass over so we can get a majority vote to pass over. So do we have a motion, Mr. Strudo? For the reasons I said previously, I think that the neighborhood enjoys open space to, to, to be clear. And I think in certain pockets where there's these little teeny pockets of open space land, I think we should make our best effort to preserve it. And one, one small house on these two lots that would have to be combined in, instead of just preserving the open space, I think is you know, not really directed to the affordable housing goal. All right, so, but I'll, 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 I'll vote to pass over. So we can have a majority and we don't have a, we'll at least have a vote on this one, a recommendation. Madam Chair, I move to recommend passing over Article 14, authorized conveyance of town-owned land for affordable housing, 44 to 46 Oak Hill Road. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo to pass over Article 14, to recommend passing over Article 14, seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. No. Mr. Walner. No. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. The motion to recommend Passover carries three to two. And the next article is Article 15, authorize the conveyance of town owned land for affordable housing at 7 St. Teresa Street. Mrs. Gonzalez, what is your pleasure on this article? I will stay consistent. I agree with Mr. O'Leary's suggestions. I agree with 
your comments also, Madam Chair, so I will stay consistent and pass over. Okay, Mr. Studo. Uh, again, I think this one, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it could be done. Um, you know, I don't see, again, a little bit different as well than even Oakdale, but uh, again, it's um, not as cause of us concern as the Haverhill Street. So I would be uh, for the right development, you know, that's the caveat as well, you know, knowing that even if town meeting said yes, we're still a long way to a yes on, you know, before a shovel hits the dirt, but I would be in favor of uh, recommending. Okay, Mr. Walner. I recommend. Mr. O'Leary. Um, I want to be something. I want to be consistent in relation to what I said previously, and I think what we should be doing is something different. But in relation to this specific parcel, I would recommend that we hold off on this because of, uh, if the two point eight nine three uh, million dollars is appro is appropriated, we're going to be doing some uh, mm -hmm. uh, sighting, and uh, we're doing some borings and sightings, and this is uh, in very close proximity to Route Twenty Eight. And if we happen to need a pump station, it's a parcel of land that we own. So uh, I would just hold off until we get that study done and find out if we need that site that particular site would be useful for a pump station for potential sewerage. Other than that, uh, same thing. I think we should be putting, we should be taking control of stuff, knowing what our parcels are and what we want to have built on it. So I would be recommending passing over. Pass over, okay. I absolutely would be against this. I mentioned this as a potential location of a station in terms of the project that we were pursuing on 28. It's our land. We wouldn't have to spend money acquiring a location, as I stated at our last meeting. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be supporting divesting ourselves of land when we know we're going to be looking for uh, locations along the route for these, you know, sort of uh, necessary, uh, for the lack of better term, accoutrements to our potential sewer program. And in addition to that, it's more valuable once the sewer, if and when the sewer, the town says yes to the sewer, and if and when the sewer comes in, as I mentioned, it would be more valuable to, to have other consideration for development of that parcel given its location and proximity to Main Street. Okay, so I would be not in favor of this article. Um, that would be my vote. Mr. Studo, you have your hand raised. Oh. In lieu of that, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Um, I would change my vote. And I just wanted to make that clear before we take the article, just because I did not, again, vote to pass over, you know, just to see where we end up at first. It just, I was looking at a couple of other things from the presentation, but yes, so I would uh, move to pass over more for, not that I don't think it's appropriate. I just think that, if if sewer is something we're going to do it you know that the, the, there'd be a lot of regret in letting go of this piece of land so that's it okay so we have passover we have a vote to pass over mr vote. waller just raised his hand also okay all right so let me just so let me just recite for the record a miss <laughs> mr studo is voting to pass over not recommend Mrs. Gonzalez is voting to pass over, not recommend. Well, you did vote to pass over. Mr. Walney, you're raising your hand. I'm just wondering, should we just be saying no? I mean, now that Steve has brought this out, should we just be saying no to this and not even pass it over? Yeah, I said no the, when we discussed it at our meeting. So absolutely, I agree with you, Mr. Walner, but we've got two, two no if you're changing your vote to I from recommend. I would change, it change your vote to no. So we have three Passovers and I would be Manupelli is a no on this one. So we have, uh, do we have, a, we have a motion to, I guess the motion to pass over is what it, what it is. And the motion is carries three to two. Oh, I don't. We didn't vote yet. We didn't vote yet. We polled, but we didn't vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? I apologize. 
there's a motion on the floor. I thought there was, and it was, yes. yes I, but the hour is late, so I could be confusing myself here. So it was a motion made to pass over, or was there not? No, I didn't do it yet. Not I'm sorry. Do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? Madam Chair, I move to recommend passing over Article 15, authorized conveyance of town-owned land for affordable housing. Okay. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo to recommend passing over Article 15, seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Studo. <laughs> recommend passing over, yes. Okay, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Uh, I'm voting for no, so I guess I'm a no. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And I'm voting no because I'm against Article 15. So I would recommend, uh, we don't recommend it. So it's the motion to pass over carries three to two. Okay, thank you. That was a very, thank you, Mrs. McKnight and Mr. Pierce. That was very helpful information. And thank you for being available to answer all those questions about the project. All right, Mr. Gilberto, we have, we're, we're finally to Article 16. So, <laughs> we thought needs, this somebody, was gonna be short because we only have 16 articles here. Someone that needs to make sure that the uh, Superintendent DeBarry and uh, School Committee Member Diamond are awake. <laughs> True, all right, there's not, oh, that's nice, okay. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair, through you. Take it away, Mr. Gilberto. Yeah. Do folks see on uh, on my screen a, a slide entitled Article 16, Authorized Northeast Metropolitan, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Yes, we see it. Excellent. Thank you. And I, I know that we are joined here by the Superintendent Director and uh, North Reading Representative um, for our um, Regional School Committee, uh, Superintendent, Superintendent Director Dave DeBerry, who's there to our left as we're looking. And then the um, North Reading School Committee member for the Regional Vocational School, Judy Diamond, to the right there. And she is also the chair of the School Building Committee for this project as well. So we certainly uh, thank them for joining. And I believe, Mr. Pacone, you are the business manager for the district. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Excellent. So uh, if I missed anyone from your team, um, to you, Mr. DeBerry. Nope, that's everybody. So uh, well, I like to speak to 10 other people here, but they left an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you for sticking around. And, and Judy was here this <laughs> afternoon trying to nail down the time. And I, I think <laughs> it started, it was going to be at 6.30. And then it, it, we told her it would be 8.30. And now it's 10.30. Oh. <laughs> well, you are Article 16. So you got the, yeah. you got the, <laughs> this is the uh, end. So I, I don't know whether the, the, the regional school district had a particular presentation, but as you can see, I prepared a very brief slide that I think just summarizes the nature of where we're at. So I'll, I'm happy to go through the slide or to you, Superintendent DeBerry, if you'd like to make a presentation, you're certainly welcome to. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, we'd love to have you go through the slide and based on the time, I know you had a long meeting, mm -hmm. um, we'd be more than happy to just sum up a few key points afterwards and be open for questions. Great, excellent. So um, I'll, I will, before I go through this slide, just say that the superintendent and his team have been extremely cooperative in providing information along this process going back multiple years. I mean, they really have tried to keep us apprised. And I think that we all feel like we are um, you know, pretty um, attuned to the project itself and the importance of the project. Um, and you know, now it's kind of advanced to this phase of the particular impact that we'll have on the member communities. So just in summary, it's a $317 million new building construction project that's estimated to receive a reimbursement from the Massachusetts School Building Authority um, to the tune of approximately $141 million. And uh, that is a number that is at uh, uh, what I will call, I believe, a high watermark uh, in that there's special legislation that's been in place to preserve the highest possible reimbursement level that actually expires uh, come uh, December of this year. So there is some urgency as to a decision on this. And I give all the credit to the world of the district and to try to make that um, work. The remaining share for all of the district communities would be $176.5 million. Probably the most notable, notable piece of information in terms of the financial component is uh, the estimated annual debt service payment, which would begin in 2023 and increase to in up to its maximum in 2026. 
of um, $271,260 uh, for a 30 year period. Um, that's sort of uh, the uh, the high watermark on the on the assessment, but it will be about that amount. And that's an estimate, obviously, running through the life of the debt um, service. That amount can be excluded under Proposition Two and a Half by ballot vote of the town, either now or at a future date. We are not recommending any such exclusion at this point in time, although it's something that we'll be looking at as we go through um, our long-term financial planning. Um, our total principal and interest payment over the life of the loan would be eight hundred eight million. $127,216, as I, uh, as I understand it. And I, all, of, all of this information came from uh, the superintendent director and his team um, in time for the article to go on the warrant last uh, Tuesday, when, or two Tuesday or Wednesdays ago. And again, I thank them for their efforts. Um, so th this is a little bit about the financial component of it. Um, you know, the need is probably the most significant thing. And I know that they can probably speak to that better than I can, but the building is in significant need of repair, although it is certainly well kept. So I'm gonna stop um, through you, Madam Chair, and um, through you, I'll just defer to the superintendent director or whoever on his team. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Um, so very happy to say, so as our manager Gilberto mentioned that we've been coming to North Reading for five years now, discussing this project. And I'm very happy to say that we were recently awarded the highest grant from the MSBA to date. So Northeast will be the, 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 the most reimbursed project to date. And it, it did take a lot of work. It didn't come easy. It was through a lot of um, you know legislation that went through that we were able to get through the House and the Senate. Um, grandfathering our rate in, and also different things that we had done to try to improve not just the, the Northeast share from the MSBA, but really trying to work with the MSBA to understand that uh, the formulas that they're currently using as far as reimbursement are, were a little outdated. So we we're able to make some really important changes. But the most important thing for those of you who have never been up to um, Northeast is that um, the building infrastructure is dying. Um, it's really coming to the end of its life. It's not just a matter of a district that would love to have a new school because it's shiny or because it would attract more people. Um, you, you may have read in the paper the other day that the morning of our town ma manager and mayor's breakfast that um, we had a propane leak, uh, leak in a pipe that was 50 years old that just about rotted. And that wasn't something um, that we could have even caught. We have thousands of miles of infrastructure, pipe and electrical and all of our utility services that are completely outdated. Um, every time my phone rings and I see it's our, our building maintenance department, I shudder that this is it. This is, this is the end of this building and we're getting near. And this is an absolute need. Um, it's something we owe it to our students and we owe it to our future students to give them this opportunity. Um, in addition to the, the, the building systems that are in need of repair, um, the entire building envelope is just poorly insulated. Um, I, I, I have a hard time even using energy efficient, efficient in the same set, um, sentence because it absolutely is, is not. Um, many, if not all of the academic classrooms and almost all of the shops are undersized uh, and do not meet the current standards from the Department of Education. Um, I think most frustrating as a former special ed teacher and a former special ed uh, director, um, our building is not accessible for the handicapped whatsoever. And it, it's tragic that, you know, our resources and our services and our options are completely limited to students with certain handicapped um, situations. So very upsetting. Uh, as far as safety, we have one road coming in and one road going out. And you know we've had some, some drills and we've had some evacuations that could have been a disaster had they been more serious situations. So um, that's just some of the need. I could go on all night, and, but I'll move on. 
But let me just add to that. I would yeah. just like to add, um, as Michael will confirm, that we actually met on that Thursday outside in the parking lot because it was and it was drizzling. It, uh, it was important for us to be able to meet with the town officials that day, and they were anxious also to meet with us. And um, they had questions, so we were able to answer that. So that was very mm -hmm. important, and we really appreciated all the efforts on their part. But also that cost us two days out of school, right from the very beginning when school opened. We had students in the parking lot in tears because they were being sent home and not to be able to open up the next day. Now that, like I said, that was just the first week of school. We pray all the time that we don't have other cases like that the rest of the school year, but we don't know. It's a mystery in here. This building is old and we do a great job with what we have, we could do a lot better with a state-of-the-art school. I'm very proud when I see the North Reading High School on that hill and how beautiful it is. And I feel the students in all of our districts that are seeking a vocational education deserve the same. So we are hoping that moving forward at town meeting, we have the support of the selectmen and the finance committee. We're hoping for that. And uh, we're hoping for a good outcome. I believe North Reading might be the first town meeting we're going to, if not the second. So it's an exciting time for us and, and especially me being the uh, North Reading School Committee member. So thank you for giving us this opportunity tonight. I, I'm sure you all know our needs. I, we don't have to go on and on about it. Uh, Dave and I had a 10 minute presentation. We were gonna show you the um, new school, but it, again, it's been a long night for you and a long night for us. So. Uh, but we, we do have pictures if you want to see them. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to let Dave finish his presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Judy. So another important aspect is we received over 800 applications this year for a little over 300 spots. So we've, we've had to turn away close to 500 students who would like a vocational education. So with that said, the, the new building that we're proposing would increase enrollment up to 1,600 students, which would give students a much more of an opportunity um, to pursue a vocational career. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of this project. Um, we did not take the price tag lightly. Um, we actually studied 40 different options before we came up with the option that we have now. Um, you know, the options went as high as 1,750 students, which we felt we could easily fill. However, we knew that it was going to have a, a, a finan financial impact on many of our communities, especially our gateway communities, um, who make up the, the majority of, of this price tag. Happy to say, even though every penny counts when it's being paid by taxpayers, that um, North Reading would be one of the lowest um, paying districts of our 12. So the, the lion's share of this project would come from cities like Chelsea, Revere, Malden, and Saugus. Now, as I said earlier, we pursued every avenue to reduce the impact to the member communities. Um, one of those, um, one of those, uh, attempts, uh, may I say, to, to make things more bearable was requesting $100 million um, from the governor and from the legislator out of this uh, multi-billion dollar um, relief package. So we will not have an answer on that prior to the 60 days needed to have this approved. And I can't promise anything, but we're gaining great traction. And that $100 million would come right off the remainder. And as you know, would significantly lower the cost, not only to North Reading, but to every, every school district when they, within the 12. And I have great confidence that we have a good chance of receiving that money. But unfortunately, we won't know prior. But we do hope, regardless of that, that we, we will have your support on this project. And Thank happy you. to answer any questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
So let's, if we have anyone in attendance that wants, or any of my colleagues that have any questions to raise your hand or Mr. Buckley, welcome. Hello, I stuck with you all night. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, on behalf of the myself, who is the chair of the North Reading School Committee, I just want to say that I very much support this. We've heard the reports from Mr. DeBerry and Ms. Diamond um, a number of years, as they mentioned. I think that it's really important for the town to understand that we have the obligation to educate all of our children. And so, you know, vocational schools are a very important part of that. And there have been issues with the facilities right now. We can't go into too much detail, but I am aware of some situations where some students couldn't attend the vocational school as it currently exists. As they mentioned, it's not accessible right now to all students. That has become an issue for you know, learning for some of our students in the past. I think it's really important that we have you know, a new building so that people can attend it. Um, I, I think that you know, I, I have a couple of questions and, and one comment for, for Mrs. Manitelli and for Mr. Gilberto. This, I think the North Reading School Committee will take a vote on this as well um, as to whether or not to recommend this. So I'll make sure I point that out at town meeting as well. I think it's important that we do, you know, we, we are heard on that. My only question for Mr. DeBerry is really about our share. So I know it's based on enrollment. Can you give a little bit of comment about how our share was, was created? And I know this is going to be paid back over a number of years, but I assume that the amount that we're, that we're paying, it will not change in the future, but we will be able to you know, have our students apply there. So even if we have a greater enrollment in the future, the amount that North Reading would be paying will not change over the 30 years. Is that correct? No, it's actually the, the amount was based on, I think we went five years back on the October numbers on, you know, what the average percentage was of North Reading students compared to the other cities and towns. And it was pretty consistent across the board. You know, yeah, you know, there might have been a couple of outlier years where there might have been a few more students or a few less, but it was based on the average and it'll be, you know, based going forward year to year on student enrollment. So it might fluctuate a little just like it currently does on the regular operating budget. But overall, it's fairly been been consistent. So so the assessment over the next 30 years is that we're vote we'd be voting on is just an a guess it will it will vary based on the actual enrollment over the next 30 years yeah so again it's using you know historical data so we don't see it that much as a guess um but but yes it may vary a little bit and that's how our operating budget has also worked um for the past 50 years which again it's been very consistent uh throughout the 50 years on the percentage of students Thank you very much. You're okay. welcome. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Are there any other questions? Let's see if there's any. I don't. Okay, Mr. McGowan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to voice my support for this project as well. Uh, I know it's shocking a school committee member would be uh, supporting uh, a project like this, but uh, I would just say that, you know, um, there, there are many who feel like the, you know, uh, vocational education in general has taken a, too much of a backseat to, uh, to, uh, to a four-year college uh, degree education, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think there's some, you know, um, I think there's some truth to that, and I think this is a, you know, a way that we can uh, provide a, a really uh, a solid, you know, options to our students. Uh, so that they do not necessarily have to commit to a four-year college degree going forward, that they can come out of high school with some skills or very close to having skills uh, to go right into the workplace, which I think is, you know, something, especially now, is uh, particularly needed. So uh, it's, it's, it, that is why I'm really uh, in really support of this project. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McGowan. And any other comments? Mr. Studo. Uh, yeah, I'll piggyback on what Mr. McGowan was saying. I do agree that, um, I mean, this is fantastic news, something newer, because I do think that uh, we forgot that not 
college is not for everyone. And, you know, we forgot also that there's a lot of jobs, actually some of the most in-demand jobs right now that we can't find are the ones out of vocational school. And, you know, last time I checked, uh, a lot of those uh, technical skills, they learn a lot more than they make a lot more than a lot of people that wear a tie every day. So I do agree that uh, it's something that having the option, you know, and for parents to have the option from a financial planning standpoint to ask their child, hey, if you don't want to do the four year college thing, like, you know, there are alternatives and there's a good alternative down the road. I think that's I think it's awesome. So just wanted to share that. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Harrelbeck. This is a really important article to um, vote yes on. Uh, the school, not through any fault of their own, um, really cannot meet the needs of today's uh, Vogue School uh, students and isn't large enough to meet the uh, number of people who want to go. There's a, there's a, and I would appreciate it if either uh, David or Judy could address the fact that there is a time element involved, that it's really important that this pass now, not next June. Um, so hopefully you could address the fact that this is something we have to do now that we can't postpone. Yep, so th that's a great question. And you know, I try to not to em overemphasize it because I don't wanna look like I'm you know, trying to threaten anybody to get this approved, but the legislation that we had approved um, you know, sunsets in December of this year. So if we do not get this approved by the end of December and have to delay the project, either to go for a ballot vote or just to kick it down the road another year, um, we would lose the guarantee of the, um, the grant. So it would drop from 140 down to about 115 at the end of December. So we're, you know, we're, we're going to lose $25 million minimum on the project. And that would be a, a disaster, I think, to, to all of the communities involved. So I thank you for pointing that out. Um, and, you know, we really need to get this done. And we, you know, we owe it to our taxpayers to do it in a way that is the least impactful, and that would be to get it done as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I, I just wanna tell you, I'm a huge supporter of this. I'm a cosmetologist by trade. I was able to own a business and um, manage corporate salons. I mean, my, my trade education has done me well. So um, to echo, my colleague, Mr. Studo, college is not for everyone and the trades are so very important. Um, it's a huge price tag, you know. Um, are, we, are we solid with that price? I mean, is that commitment, does it stop there? Are we, is that set in stone? I think that would be to David, David or Judy. Yeah, so like I said, is I, I would love and am hopefully looking forward to coming back to this committee, uh, you know, in less than a year and saying we got $100 million off this price tag, and it is by far the best deal in the history of this state for a public school or any public property. And, I, I, and we're close. I, I really, we have so much support. Um, from both senators and state representatives on this matter. And we've already gotten the ear of the governor and nobody's been able to make a decision on when, it, when any of that, you know, multi-billion dollar money is gonna be allocated, but we definitely are on the list to be considered. Okay, thank you. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Gonzalez, you all said, Mr. Walner. Yeah, I'm just doing a quick math here. That 8.1 million looks to me like um, an increase of property tax of about $50 per household per year, which is, you know, not really tremendously impactful. Um, and I am aware that Governor Baker has stated many times how much he is in support of vocational schools. So I, I would expect the full reimbursement to come through. So I'm, I'm in favor of what I see. Thank you for doing it. Okay. So, oh, um, just, 
Mr. Gilberto. So the payment for that, um, for the, the payment for that price tag, where could you go over that a little bit more sure. in detail? Sure. So, I mean, the, the number that I sort of gravitate towards is our share of the um, overall share for district communities which uh, ended up being, I believe, about $8.1 million, including principal and interest. And when you, when you break that down over a 30-year period, it's roughly $271,000 per year in assessment. And so that certainly is not an insignificant number. And I know Mr. Kelleher and Mr. Mrs. Robert are on the call here. You know, our, our non-exempt debt, so the debt that has not been approved above and beyond Proposition 2.5 is roughly $1.2 million, plus or minus, and many of you have heard that number in our financial planning team meetings. So, you know, proportionally, it's, you know, approaching a quarter of that number. It's not insignificant. Um, so there will be some prioritization that will have to happen as this comes onto our books. As I mentioned, um, that amount can be excluded, meaning that it can be, go above and beyond the tax levy either now or at a future date, um, according to the presentation we heard from um, the advisors to Northeast. We're not recommending that action at this point in time, to be clear, but I do need to be upfront with folks that we need to keep that in mind as a possibility when we start to feel the real impact of that in fiscal year 2026. And I, I will yes, also, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilbert, are you okay? So I just, I, I just wanted to add that uh, the, the Northeast was been, they've been very, um, you know, great. Uh, and uh, Madam Chair, through you, I know the community you work in was one of a few that supported seeking that funding. And I know that the consulting um, folks from Northeast committed to drafting a letter for the area town administrators and town managers to sign off on to supplement that again, to try to get support for that funding to defray that cost, mm -hmm. because we know that this is, um, it's not just a want, it's a need. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. And are there any other questions? Okay, I do. I see Mr. Kelleher's hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kelleher. Thank you, Mr. Just, Kelleher. Just, just an observation. I think I heard the superintendent, if I heard him correctly, that this school will will be bigger than than the current school, so the the enrollment, uh, you'll be able to enroll a significantly higher number of students. To the extent that we're not that we are not proportionally increasing the number of kids going there, uh, and I don't know whether we will or we won't, um, then our share could could likely go down as well. I mean, it looked like you're going to add a, a, a fair number of additional students with this new school. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So when you re redo the the distribution of the of of the allocation of the costs over the uh, the uh, uh, proportionate number of of children going from each of the communities, uh, if we're not adding a lot more kids in other communities are, then our share could could very well go down. I, I think this is, I think whether that happens or not, this, I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, vocational ed education is, 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 is very, very important. And I just echo the comments that others have made that uh, college is not for everyone. And we need people working in our communities that have got vocational education um, and uh, I, I applaud you for what you're doing. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just again, just more comment than question. Again, I've been the liaison to the school here for a number of years, and um, they, they do a fantastic job with what they have uh, what they what they have to work with right now, which is uh, woefully inadequate. And again, they, they've done a great job of maintaining the facility for as long as it can be, can be maintained and beyond. So this is, there's no doubt about the need. You know, in relation to North Reading's uh, relationship with the, with the school has been terrific over the years. Again, we're the, one of the smaller communities, uh, so that we're bearing a smaller portion of the cost, certainly, uh, to provide our uh, student population here who want to go for vocational educations. Um, we, we need to give them a state-of-the-art uh, uh, facility. And so legislatively, I mean, they have a very strong lobby down there, which is huge in relation to getting the uh, 
reimbursement levels that they're looking for. Time is of the essence and it's important for us to capitalize on that. Uh, and again, but there's additional funds that, that may become available. Um, kudos to, to the administration there and the members of the school committee for advocating vocally and going out there and pressing their legislators to, uh, to advocate for, for the school system here. And um, I just wish them much, much success and not so many bumps in the roads. And Mr. Kelleher can attest to that. There'll be some bumps in the road. And Judy, you need to have your head examined for taking this project on, but uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll get it done. You'll, you'll get it done. And, uh, no, uh, we'll be fighting on. And again, hopefully, um, as you've heard here today, there's widespread support. Uh, hopefully we can convince Tom we need to go along with it too. Uh, there's no good reason not to, so. Thank uh, you. So Great, best of luck you. and again, uh, congratulations for the award and uh, thank you for coming forward on a timely basis so we'll have an opportunity uh, to act on it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a, if there's no further questions, I just had a couple of comments. Um, I think you covered this, but the amount that of our share that's being calculated is based on the current, the that current building construction amount, right? Yeah. Okay. And is that is that other than how that's going to be paid for? That's a fixed amount. You have that under contract. That amount is fixed, and you're not going to be coming back to us when your contractor says, you know, we need another ten million or another twenty million, right? You have that under an agreement, right? Yes, we do. Yep. Okay, and they're not, they, they don't have the ability to come back and say we miscalculated or there's any kind of problem like that going on with their valuation, right? Correct. Okay, and so the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is, so we've calculated kind of the maximum amount of our contribution towards this, given what you've given us as a percentage of our enrollment historically, right? Did I understand you to say that? So, exactly. based, and so based upon our contribution to this, are we eligible to send more of our students to the school? Yeah. yeah. So every town has a quota, and it's based on the percentage of your eighth grade students in comparison to the twelve cities and towns. So currently, uh, North Reading does not fill its quota. Okay. So there is still. Yeah, so there are still openings in um, North Reading for more students. So in other words, our contribution is not necessarily linked to the actual number of students that go. It's linked to the number of students eligible to go. No, I'm sorry. It's the actual students who go, but you are allowed more students um, if more students applied. I see. Okay. So in other words, we, we don't typically meet our quota. So we don't need an increase in the number of students in, to that quota. What's that based on population? Yep, so eighth grade population. So the eighth grade student enrollment. So does that change have, annually? If there's a, not again, uh, very slight changes if there are demographic changes. For some reason, if you have a, a, a lower eighth grade population, it might change from a student or two, but it's again over, you know, the 50 years, it's been fairly consistent across the 12 communities. But if you have this brand new building, there might be increased enrollment, which would be kind of one of the desires of doing this in addition to just kind of, it's, let, it's at its end of its useful life. Right, so and also this. listening to the prior articles, if you do expand housing and the population grows, which would grow the eighth grade population, then you would have the opportunity for more students to come. So that's what I wanted to ask you. So if I think we're planning on this based on this fixed cost at this moment in time that you have under agreement locked in with your contractor, that's not gonna come back and say, oh, we did something, we need more. We wanna do a different design and we need more money and come back and say, oh, we had the figures wrong, so to speak. But we're locked in based on our current quota. But once this is you know, in motion and being funded and paid for, the only variation will be if you are able to successfully uh, obtain additional 
uh, state or federal funds to pay for this that'll reduce the amount that we're contributing over the course of time, right? Right, but it, it could vary year to year, you know, from a student to two students. So some years it might be less, just like the operating budget. Some years it might be a little more, but not an extravagant amount. Okay, all right. So that's what I was just, I'm just wondering. So why would it be more though if we're locked in with this amount for the building? Well, we're locked in, well, we're locked in with the price of the building, but it's based on your percentage of students. So if some re for reason, if you had more students from year to year, then that would be tapped on to the individual student. So the year to year bond payments are based on student population and student enrollment. Okay. Uh, okay. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, just to follow up on your question, a line of questioning, Madam Chair. Um, how many more seats are we looking to add for the student population there? So we're looking to add less than 300, which um, based on your current enrollment, if, you know, if we added that extra percentage, would that, you know, the maximum probably look at less than 10 more students. So again, it wouldn't be a number that would stand out that would make that much of a difference on the bottom line payments. No, other than of those 300 new students that are coming in, I mean, we don't meet our current quota. So I, this is to follow up on Mrs. Manifelli's uh, uh, comments in relation to our share. I mean, if we're not meeting our quota now, and you're gonna put three more, 300 more seats in there, and uh, say it's 25% of that is the eighth grade class, you know, then those are gonna to go to some other communities who are going to pick up a greater share of the cost and North Reading's percentage is going to shrink. If the status quo remains the same when North Reading is, is still not meeting its quota. Because right. the other communities are picking up the tab by sending students there. Say, say our population stays about the same as far as what's going to be sent to the vocational school every year. And you say it doesn't deviate much every year. It stays pretty much the same for the next 15 years. Um, yeah, our, our percentage is going to decrease, which is actually a good thing to point out. So, yeah, and I also use the data on the vocational schools that have been built in the past 10 years. They, they've all concluded that the percentages have pretty much stayed the same even after the new school was built. Okay. So, there isn't a history of any major fluctuation. Uh, you know, um, on you know, any of the projects. All right, you're talking 75 seats for the eighth grade class, so it wouldn't change that much. Okay, great, thank you. I just have one more, uh, a couple of more questions um, sure. that I was, uh, and it actually had to do with enrollment. You do you you have applications for 1,600 students, or did you have seating for 1,600? I mean, uh, so. so what do you, for 1,600 students total. Is that what you have right now? Nope, right now we have over 1,300. So there would be a, about an additional- Oh, I see, I see. Okay, you wanna go from 13 to 1,600. Yep. Do you turn away students who apply? Sadly, we turn away more students than we accept. What's your, how many students do you typically turn away? Typically, we turn away about 350. Um, this year, we've turned away almost 500 because we had a, a big increase in applications post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Can't explain exactly why, but definitely this is our biggest application year. Okay. All right. I think I'm all set. Thank you for answering all those questions. And I do not see any other hands raised, so I'd actually call for a... Let, let me pull the members with regard to a recommendation on this one, because we waited to hear this e this evening. So, Mrs. Gonzalez, what's your recommendation on this? You're muted. I recommend. All right. You you want to take a vote to recommend, Mr. Studo? Uh, recommend. Mr. Walner? Recommend. Mr. O'Leary? Enthusiastically recommend. And I concur. So do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to recommend 
Article 16, authorize Northeast Metropolitan Regional Vocational School District construction project. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo to recommend Article 16, seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. So unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you for attending and giving and giving us all that information. It's very helpful. And I know we've got a long road and we still have to get through the town meeting, but I think if I could reach over and hug the television, I might. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a it great nice. for us. It was definitely <laughs> worth the wait. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. So, well, I think we've reached the end of our informational hearing. And so we'll close that portion of the meeting. I do have a, oh, that's nice. We have some nice comments in the chat. And it's from, thank you for all you do for our beloved. Thank you everyone for all you do for our beloved town. So we get some extra comments after that. So thank you everyone for attending. We don't usually have this many people stay this late <laughs> for our meetings. And uh, we'll just move on with the, we'll move on to the next order of business. Madam Chair, we do not have a quorum of the Planning Commission present, so I suggest passing over item six. All right, so we will pass over that item. Next order of business is joint I mean, excuse me, vote to extend the temporary, I'm sorry, vote to extend the temporary outdoor dining. M Madam Chair, I am seeing a, a comment in the chat requesting to make one more comment. Oh, sure. I'm not, I'm not sure what on. <laughs> sure. Well, you, you stayed this late. We might as well let you <laughs> give us one more comment. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry to um, to keep everybody late. Um, I, I hope that this next two minutes is going to be uh, informational. I forgot to share on the on the screen. Okay, can I may I share something on the screen? What is this regarding? Uh, this is regarding a map that I forgot to show everyone. That sure. kind of give a sense of. Uh, can you guys see the the map? Yes. So what um, what what Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Daniel McKnight uh, sent everybody the uh, butter around the neighborhood doesn't have all the doesn't have the clear picture of what the land it looks like. Mm -hmm. So I kind of actually, by the way, everybody, this is my first democratic process. I I, I really enjoyed it uh, in the states. So thank you, everybody, staying this late. I truly feel that uh, the democratic process uh, is in play here. I thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Rich. And thank you, everybody. I didn't okay, get everybody's thank name. You. Thank you, That's Leon. Nice. We usually yeah. are the only ones listening to ourselves at this late hour. So we appreciate <laughs> we I really appreciate it. Company. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Studo, uh, for voting no for the Passover. And uh, thank you, Rich uh, Warner, for listening to us. And thank you for voting no uh, on this subject. But this picture really shows um, from the summer standpoint of view, rather than winter point of view, that um, the CPC uh, uh, folks sent. I, I, I personally am not against the low income housing, but I just want to show a summer view of the area view of the property here, the socks the socks or shoe shape, whatever you call it, is the Heritage Way property. And this is the this is the area, the red circle area is really the land that the CPK is proposing for taking away from the area, building the uh, multifamily units. And what Mr. Tashara here, I, I live here, Mr. Tashara here is at 34. And more than more than that, and these houses are actually the area that are gonna be impacted as well because and once this is built, all the wetlands, I, I, I overheard, I think that's what I heard because I don't know everything. I don't have all the information because I moved in a few years ago. Um, but I would like to share with every one of you that uh, for your consideration that this project, uh, 
potentially uh, what what's in stake here and what's being what's being taken away from the neighborhood. I'm not talking about the forest. Uh, that's probably the first point of uh, first point that you guys would think of uh, what happens to the forest that's being mm -hmm. taken away. All the Mm -hmm. um, we're not we're not liking the coyote, of, of course, but uh, what happens to the wildlife? But that's the past beside the point, right? Uh, and also the, the, the most important point is that um, the, the wetland that's unknown to to me and as well as many other neighborhoods. So uh, I hope I hope this uh, this view uh, helps you guys, and I'm sure many of you guys have been living in the neighborhood in North Reading. Uh, for many, many years, opposed to me, just a freshman here. Um, so I just want to share that with you and uh, Mr. O'Leary and Mike and uh, Kate okay. and Rich and uh, Mr. Tu Studo. Thank you. Mr. Tu, just to make sure we, I want to be clear that uh, the members voted on this Article 13, four of the members voted to pass over. Right. Uh, I voted against passing over because I'm against the article. However, the recommendation from the board, because it was four to one, will be to pass over the article. That's just a recommendation. It's still coming up for a vote. The CPC still said they were moving to have this, they, they were going to motion, make the motion to authorize this. So that's still going to come up for a vote just because the select board, did, you know, made a motion to pass over. It's just a recommendation. So it's you. you still have to go to the meeting and vote. You, you know, either vote to pass over it or you or you vote against passing over and you vote against this if you're against it. So you, you still have to go and vote at the town meeting. Yes, all I'll right. make sure of that with all the neighborhoods. And uh, I like, like I said, I appreciate all the democratic process. I enjoy this very first time. So that, great. That this is a truly great. Great. We welcome you. And thank you so much for your input. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Good night. Have thank a, you. Have a good night, guys. You Bye. too. You all right, our, so our next order of business would be to vote to extend the temporary outdoor dining, Mr. Gilberto. I saw nothing in the packet on this or the next uh, couple of items, so I'm not Thank sure. You, Chair. So the, the vote to extend a temporary outdoor dining is to continue the setup that we have had going through the pandemic. Um, you may recall that uh, almost a year ago, this board voted to um, extend temporary outdoor dining to 60 days after the end of the pandemic, which was the, the, this, after the end of the state of emergency, which was the latest possible moment that it could be extended to. Subsequently, there was legislation approved at the state level in June that allowed for such extension to be extended further to April 1st, 2022. And we are simply asking for that vote this evening. We have uh, two or three that are actively using outdoor dining under this provision. We don't know whether they're going to continue through the winter or not. We just want to make that available to them as an option, as it has been for the past year and a half. Perfect. So I have a motion. Madam Chair, I move to extend previously approved permits for temporary outdoor dining to April 1st, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Absolutely aye. And Manu Pelli is absolutely aye. So the motion carries. Next order of business is the reappointments for the facilities master plan committee. What about investment policy reading? That, that is being, I'm sorry, that was struck because it's being passed over because it's still under review prior to it coming to our. Uh, you know, prior to it coming to our first reading. So we're, we're, we're gonna move past that and probably dock it for the next meeting or next meeting that we can address it, okay? So the next order of business would be the reappointments of the facilities master plan committee. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, there are, I believe three reappointments that are pending. Um, one is for yourself, one is for Mr. McGowan, and I'm going to remind myself of the third without scrolling through the packet here. I know Mrs. Hurlbut is here and I'm sure she has that answer. Mrs. Uh, Mr. Kelleher. Kelleher. It's Mr. Kelleher. 
Mr. Keller. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so do I have a, a motion, Mr. Studo, for the reappointments to the Facilities Master Plan Committee? Chair, I move to reappoint the following individuals to the Facilities Master Plan Committee for the terms noted. Captain Mendepelli, Select Board, through May 7, 2024. Donald Kelleher, Capital Improvement Plan Committee through June 30, 2024. Richard McGowan, School Committee through May 7, 2024. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Studo? Aye. That should be roll call. It should be name, name vote. At the minute, Helen Donald Kelleher, Richard McGowan. Mr. S oh, um, excuse me, Mr. Walner. Don Kelleher, Mr. McGowan. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Catherine Manny Pelly, Don Kelleher, and Rich McGowan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. You don't have to vote for all three. No, no, I just used an accident. <laughs> Kate, Kate Manny Pelly, too. Sorry, that was just an accident. Good clarification. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tired of Mr. Oh, yes, I know it's late. Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Manny Pelly, Mr. McGowan, Mr. Kelleher. All right, and Manny Pelly is Manny Pelly McGowan and Kelleher. All set. Okay, now our next order of business is the town administrator's report. Madam Chair, you saw I did not have a written report in the packet this evening, but I will report um, verbally that the Department of Public Works will be advertising for contractors for the upcoming snow and ice season. And um, once again, due to anticipated um, shortages in available equipment and the um, increasing average rate of compensation. They will be increasing the rates for individual pieces of equipment between $10 and $20 um, per hour um, for uh, rolling stock. So as has been the case the past couple of years, I'm just informing the board, um, you know, we'll look to make any adjustments with regard to a budget uh, during the budget process for the next fiscal year. And that concludes my comments. It's great. Does anyone have any questions? That's good. All right. So we're going to move on. We're going to do board member reports, old and new business. Mr. Studo, anything more you want to add this evening? Uh, no. <laughs> um, okay. I, I, uh, I know that uh, my, I think uh, Leanne and Steve can talk about anything, uh, and Leanne in particular, about the EDC event at the uh, apple tasting thing. Uh, you know the lab, the apple party that happened at the common the uh, the other day, um, which unfortunately I couldn't attend because I was in between like sixteen different sports. But I was in North Reading. I kept driving by it. Um, and other than that, no, and uh, no new business either. No old business. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, yes. Yeah, so the Apple Fest was a great success, um, Mr. O'Leary and I got to eat three different pies that were all delicious. And all, all award winning. All award winning because they were only three. So <laughs> they all got a prize, which made our life very easy. <laughs> to be the good guys. <laughs> um, the EDC had an informational table for um, the wastewater sewer project, and we had I, I tried to, I was kind of all over the place all day, but I tried to show up there um, as much as I could and answer some questions. And um, I thought it was really great, very informative. And people seem to enjoy being able to see it visually and ask their questions. So I thought that was a great success. <clears throat> um, I know that it's late. Please forgive me guys, but there's something I'm passionate about. And if you can hang in there with me, just give me a few minutes to, um, I wanna talk about the governor's mandate um, that he ordered on state workers. Um, I'm gonna speak as your colleague, but I'm also gonna speak as a mother. You all know that my daughter's a state trooper. Um, a letter that went out from the Colonel because of the mandate um, as of October 17th, if, an executive branch employee is not vaccinated and refuses to get vaccinated, they will be put on a five-day unpaid suspension. 
If at the end of the five day suspension, an employee still refuses to be vaccinated, they will be given a 10 day unpaid suspension. If at the end of the 10 day suspension, employee still refuses to be vaccinated, they will be terminated. Um, there's no option to test weekly without an exemption and the exemptions are being denied. So basically you don't get vaccinated, you get fired. These are the people who protect and serve us, who worked through a pandemic, without a vaccine, who mostly all contracted the virus, recovered and have antibodies. Um, to me, I mean, whether you believe in the vaccine or not, nothing, nobody should ever be forced to put something in their body. And if they don't, they lose their livelihood that they've worked for and their families will now have no <laughs> income maybe. Um, we're about to lose between seven and 800 troopers who are refusing to get the vaccine. This is a public safety issue. So I'm asking my colleagues to please support me in writing a letter to the governor asking him to either drop the mandate or at the very least to allow these troopers to test weekly without strings attached, such as religious exemptions, um, which they have not been approving. So. Um, I'm just asking for all of you to support this. Did, did you have a, a letter that you had drafted for I consideration? Um, I was just asking for if I would, if I could get support for that, and then I would draft that up. We've done that in the past. And I just, um, I, let me just get some comment from the from my from our colleagues mr walner what's your thought with regard to supporting this at, at letter or yeah no i can't i can't support that um but uh, you know i have you know i care about people losing their jobs but you know people who are in public safety have committed to saving the community and this is an act that they should be taking willingly because that's part of what their job is i mean they're willing to give up their lives to 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 save their community this is a reasonable request. And my daughter is a nurse and, um, you know, I'm seeing, she's down in Florida. She has an ICU wing for COVID. I'm also getting reports about what's happening there. Um, people need to get vaccinated if they want to have this kind of job. It's my opinion. Okay, Mr. Studo. This is not simple. So I'll try to keep it simple. If that even makes any sense at 11.25 at night. Mm -hmm. So I think that there needs to be a way out of this without putting people in a position to do something they don't want to do, but at the same time, to make sure that those that are serving the community in a capacity where they may have access to everyone, whether they like it or not, based on something happening. You know, so I do think that a happy medium needs to be worked on. I don't know what that is. The, the testing like was being done up until a month ago seemed like it was working. Um, but I feel that, you know, just naturally, I think that it's the forcing that I have a problem with. So I would support a letter that let's just say makes it a point that we understand what the vaccine does mm -hmm. and how it, you know, it can alleviate some risk, but we also understand, is there a way where we don't alienate those that, you know, we have to say it, including Mr. Walner's daughter for a while during the worst of it, they worked without a vaccine. Right. I mean, and that that's fact. And there's so I'm just saying that the same precautions that we're taking, then if we can find just a happy medium, and there's a letter where, you know, both sides, if that's possible, you know, if, if we can find something like that, I could get behind a letter like that, because I do feel that, you know, it, it just, I'm a student of history, I've, I've brought it up a, a lot of times, and this really has nothing to do with COVID. But I have seen this slippery slope and I've read through it and I do this for fun on the beach when other people read like you know whatever your leisure reading is I've read primary text from 
politicians for the last 200 years. And I, you know, I'm just saying that if there's, if there's a solution here, and I think there is, and Mrs. Gonzalez uh, crafts a letter that I think takes into account that I do feel that, you know, I'm vaccinated, that the vaccine does work, but there's a medium where we don't put people in a position to choose their livelihood or, you know, doing something they don't want to do. I, I, I could get behind that. That's all I'm asking, Mr. Studo. That, that, that's exactly what I'm asking to, okay. to not be final with it, to give them the option to test. Mr. O'Leary. The short answer is no, I cannot support it. And let, let me explain why, and, and specifically to, to law enforcement and public safety uh, personnel. Um, you know, all of you know that my son is a, is a Boston police officer. And uh, again, same thing, worked many months on the streets um, with no ability to be vaccinated. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, he um, you know, didn't, didn't catch COVID. But he is vaccinated now, and that was by choice. It wasn't by by force, but it was by choice. But if we if we look at you know, public safety officials, police and firefighters, um, enjoy certain benefits that other public employees do not, and that's when it comes to COVID right now. The assumption is if they get COVID, it's in the line of duty. If they get COVID and they have to go out on permanent disability, one eleven F, it's assumed. It's, it's in a line of duty. If they get COVID and they die, it's in line of duty. We provide our public safety officers with a whole host of uh, tools and equipment to protect them while they're out there protecting us. So they've taken an oath to the responsibility to protect the public, public good, public health, all of it. And, and that's part of the job requirements and what they swore to do. We provide them with the tools. We provide them with about 30 to 40 pounds of equipment that they carry around on their waists and belt and, and backs every single day, including, you know, uh, weapons and including vests to protect them. We're also providing them an opportunity to protect them and the public with a vaccine. They need to take advantage of that. And if they don't want to take advantage of that, then I'm sorry. You know, that, that's, that's where their choice lies. You know, they, they've got a vocation here that they've chosen to go into. Uh, and along with it comes a whole host of, of uh, liberties that they're giving up, just like anybody in public service. And, and I think it's important that, uh, and particularly public safety officials and public safety uh, employees, take that obligation seriously and, their, and the oath that they've taken seriously and the tools that are provided to them and use them. So I feel badly about it, but these are not normal times. We're in the middle of a pandemic here. The numbers are getting worse. The headline banner story in the Boston Globe today, I don't know if you read it, was the number one killer of law enforcement personnel over the last two years in the first six months of this year is COVID. It outnumbers by twice, two times, anything else that has happened to public safety yeah. officials, whether it's, you know, killing the line of duty, COVID has killed more law enforcement officers than any other occurrence, whether it be we're, we're, stops, whether it be car accidents, whether it be shot, whether it be stabbed. So, to me, they need to use it. They need to be. Uh, they need to be vaccinated. They need to assume their obligations, and they have a choice. And I think the governor is making the right decision. So, I'm sorry I cannot uh, endorse it. Yeah, and I struggle with this one too. I I don't think we we even had any kind of a mandate locally because we had so many of our um, employees and public safety officers get vaccinated just because that was the right thing to do. Um, I'm not sure either about a religious exemption. I don't know what the, what would the religious exemption be uh, that you met, you mentioned. If you want to. What's I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't hear that. You want to get into that? I can tell you what that is about. I, I am curious about that. I'm not necessarily opposed to, to considering if, if you had a draft. I'm not necessarily opposed to considering it if you, um, if you had a draft. But I also think there's, in addition to the, the presumption, there's also a, a bill pending for, and it's 
particularly or specifically for, for first responders to, I don't, know, I don't know what the status is, whether or not it passed or not, but it was to add years of service or age, three years of service or age or a combination of the two, just in, in gratitude for their being out there on the front line during this, this time frame. So I think there's other things that are being done to, you know, accomplish, uh, you know, additional benefits, like, like uh, Mr. O'Leary mentioned, to accommodate the fact that these, that these people are putting their lives on the line on a regular basis. And, but I'm not necessarily opposed to it, Mrs. Gonzalez. I just, I don't understand what a religious exemption would be either, but I'd want to see it before I would even agree to, to agree to it. And I would think that, it would just not be a, I, I think it would just be a, you know, request for reconsideration, although I'm not, I'm not necessarily sold because I don't know why we would even be getting involved in telling the governor what to do, to do with, well, I just don't know why we would be involved in that. It was mail-in voting. So we wrote a letter saying that we had an opinion on that because Mr. O'Leary made the point that the governor needs to hear from boards around the state to see where they stand on something and how they feel about it. So, um, because yeah, no, but that, that had to do with, that had to do with, uh, uh voting that we're all involved in. And this is really the public the safety issue. There's, there's at least 800 troopers who are about to be fired in October. So, you know, I don't really want to go back and forth on an, a debate on it, but I understand what you're saying about a public safety issue, but, it, but I can understand the opposing view that it's also a public safety issue for people not to be vaccinated who are, you know, basically administering, administering to the public on a daily basis too. So, but again, what I'm saying is, the mail-in ballots and things like that had a direct impact because we were all voting in an election and the census had an impact because we were, there was a direct impact to, to our community. And those types of things that we wrote in about were, were going to have a direct impact on North Reading. But this is something within the governor is the one that manages that, um, you know, that's, that's an agency under the governor's purview, not our purview. So I think that, like I said, I'm not necessarily opposed to it if, if we could see what you're proposing. I don't get the religious exemption whatsoever. So I, I'm not following that at all. We can talk about that now or, or, or later. It is late. <laughs> I know it is, but I mean, I didn't know you were going to bring this up, but, I'm, but you did. And I, I think it's it's a good, we could have a debate for the next five hours about it, you know, but I do, I mean, I, I'm, I think what you could do is maybe because as three of us that aren't necessarily you, you, Mr. Studo, and I not necessarily opposed to it, but I would have to see it and even understand why, what would I, what, why would I involve, why would we get involved in that? It would, you know, it would be like the governor telling Mr. Gilberto, what to do with our own public safety people. And really that's kind of within Mr. Gilberto's discretion and our, you know, in a sense, in a sense, you know, it's separate. I think it's separate. So, but I mean, I'm happy to look at a letter if you want to, if you want to send us a draft of something, maybe people would take a look at it and change their mind on whether or not to send it. Okay. I appreciate that. Is there any, uh, and then you, you can explain the religious exceptions. <laughs> Maybe we'll wait to, to hear that one on another, another night, unless you want to talk about it. You can give us a nutshell explanation of that one. It I'm all to, ears. But. It has to do with stem cells from aborted babies. So it's a Catholic issue. That the virus, that the vaccine was um, originally tested with. Oh, okay, yeah, I. So we could get oh, into that at another time. We, we, we could get into that, but the Catholic Church's position is is that you have an obligation to get vaccinated. The Pope's position. The what? 
That's the Pope's position. Oh, no, no, we can't get into no, that. We're, we're, we're way off the beaten no. track path here. So okay. let's go back to really, we're at the end of the meeting. We need board member reports and all yep. the new so business. We, we have a tendency to get off the rails now because it's so late. So let's get back on the rails and move forward. So I will draft a letter and I will bring it to you, Madam Chair, and um, I'll bring it to the next meeting. Well, yeah, just give it to Mr. Gilberto, actually, so people have a chance to look at it. I would like to, um, all right, because I would like to get it to him before that date. What have, date? What do you, oh, when is that? October date? 17th, they'll, they'll, they'll all be suspended without paid for five days, then 10, then terminated. Okay. All right. Do you have any other? What else do you have you got for us? That was a, that was a doozy. So let's uh, let's talk. <laughs> do you have anything else? Board member reports? Nope. I, I did my EDC. I did my Apple Fest. I'm good. Uh, yes. Yeah. That was great. Okay, Mr. O'Leary. Um, Board of Health uh, didn't find it necessary to meet this past week, so there will be there was meeting scheduled for uh, the seventh of uh, of October to again further analyze the numbers locally here and take whatever action they deem would be necessary. So uh, the 7th at uh, 7 p.m., if anybody wants to tune in. Um, I, again, I just like to comment on the Apple Festival, the Historical and Antiquarian Society, the Minute Militia, uh, all of the uh, people that, uh, again, the Recycling Committee, uh, North Ready Against Hate, I mean, I mean, all the tables, the Council on Aging, uh, by the way, the Boston Post came, I don't know if we've got a chance to see it. Uh, is is okay. now in the possession, and uh, hopefully it'll be um, given out at the Thanksgiving dinner if we get to have it. Uh, it's, so the replica has been made and delivered, and it's uh, it's beautiful. It's good. So I, I, again, they they've done a fantastic job, and again for the minimal militia and, and historical and antiquarian society, you know what they've done down at uh, down in that area is is fantastic. You know the maintenance of the buildings, the new flagpole uh, was dedicated. Um, which was the old flagpole that was on the common that blew over. I mean, they've just done a, done a fantastic job on a, on a shoestring, and I'm glad that we were able to get them some money this year to assist them. Um, and again, there are still a, a few people in this community who contribute substantial amounts of money and time and effort uh, to maintain that, uh, that facility down there and to be congratulated and, and appreciated. And again, I, uh, Madam Chair, in relation to the beginning of the meeting, we took a moment of silence for uh, Officer Donnelly. It's greatly appreciated. He was a terrific guy. Again, basically grew up in North Reading. His uh, son Kevin is a police officer here, and you, you were absolutely right, right on mark when you know he was doing community policing uh, before it was a, a common phrase. And he's uh, going to be sorely missed. And a uh, terrific fellow, and a wonderful guy, and a wonderful public servant. And uh, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with him. So other than that, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Walner. Yeah, uh, just two brief things. One is uh, the Forest Committee, which has been dormant for a long time due to the pandemic, uh, where we had to have in-person meetings, has been reactivated. And we're attending next week a MAPC-hosted uh, program on how to um, uh, improve your trails in your town, paths, things of that nature and also how to get funding and things of that nature. So the goal of the forest committee is to put the forest management part on hold for right now and to actually make Swan Pond especially more accessible to the town, uh, 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 do much to improve the trails, do markings, just make it much more of a professional um, uh, amenity for all of us. And this just falls in line with that open space uh, study that we, we um, that they did about a year ago. So it falls right in line with that. So we're excited to get going on that. And the second thing is it looks like uh, we'll be doing the age friendly presentation in the distance learning lab. And so if you can pencil it in, I especially like the board to attend to it. It would be the last week of October, either the Wednesday or Thursday. And I'll go back to Maureen and Phil um, Northam and transcript about advertising that to get, um, you know, high attendance. And it, it, is, it does represent the re results uh, I, as far as I know, one of the highest uh, um, input from residents we've ever had. And it really sets up a, a good um, understanding about where the town's at 
our demographic changes and where we should be preparing to do that, that we haven't already started to do. So that'll be the end of October. I'll announce that date as soon as I can, but if you can pencil that in, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. I just wanna say a quick thank you to the uh, North Reading Fire Department and North Reading Police Department for the, and the, and the um, Sh Sharon Kelleher and the library staff for the nine and Sue Magner, of course, for the 9-11 uh, commemoration. There was a, a nice and solemn service and the library set up a um uh, set up a um an exhibit that uh, I guess from what I understand Sharon and uh, Mrs. Kelleher was pretty instrumental in getting that to the library something to commemorate the day and it was very well done it was solemn and very well done the town administrator was there mr studo was there so it was a, a good day to a good ceremony to commemorate what has uh transpired what had transpired and not to forget those events uh, or the people that we lost it to those events or the veterans that we've lost since those events so I just wanted to thank all of them for putting that together and for doing that for our town. We do need to pick a date for a strategic planning meeting because we were not able to meet. So we're trying to get that one in person. I know we have, I know we, we need to pinpoint a date because I think it's, this one is gonna just happen no matter what. So do, do you mind if we try to do that now while we're, while we're all still here and physically here. <laughs> Can we do that uh, now, Mr. Gilberto? Certainly. Oh my word. Are we gonna do this in person or by virtual? In person. Okay, good. Oh. Well, well, we thought it would be in person. I don't know. In person or virtual? Let's just pick a day. I, I would just note that through you, Madam Chair, at this time, there is a requirement to wear a facial covering other than when eating or having um, having the floor. So, you know, just I would just urge the board members to be aware of that. I'm hopeful that the Conditions will continue to improve as they did week over to week over week with the data, but um, that is something I just would make folks aware of. Okay. What are we looking at for? I know we have quite a few things coming up for quite a few things that we're working on in the immediate immediate future. So can we look at a day perhaps after the town meeting, but relatively soon before, <laughs> before, the, before sometime in the October to November vicinity that we have? Yeah. Um, yeah. First week of November would be good. Or second week of November. Second week. Because we have a select board on the first. Why can't I say wildfire? Do we do the eight? I have a dentist appointment on the third. Maybe they'll wire me shut and it'll be a short meeting. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I just throw it out there. The fourth yeah, it yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> the third. <laughs> we'll have the meeting. Well, you know, it's late. So, do we have, does everybody have the, so November 1st? Is our yeah, the regular board meeting? meeting. Yeah. yeah, the regular meeting on the first. Yeah. Okay. I can do the eighth. It, does the eight, eighth work for everybody? A Monday. First I can do the Yeah. Looks like it. Mr. Gilberto, does that work for you? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. That's great. And it's still 6 30. Sure. 6.30, does that work for everybody? Yep. That's what we had before, that's the only reason I asked. Yep. All right, that's great. All right, okay. Thank you, folks, and with that,
I think Madam we're. Chair, I move to adjourn. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Our menu, Pelly is aye. All right. Good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Good night.